Good morning, everybody. My name is Elena Pop. I am the executive director of the Eviction Defense Network in Los Angeles County, California. This presentation is about the eviction process. We try to give you all of the details of what will happen from the notice through the eviction process. Um, and we will have opportunities to ask questions at the end. We are recording the presentation. Please keep yourselves on mute. Uh, and also please, um, um, hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Um, the Eviction Defense Network has been at the forefront of stopping gentrification and displacement in LA County since 2003. We are a private nonprofit organization uh, and we are part of the Right to Counsel Coalition, which is working for a statutory right to counsel whenever tenants face eviction. We are also part of the Stay Housed LA program, which is funded by the city of Los Angeles, the county of Los Angeles, and a couple of other smaller cities like Long Beach and Santa Monica with a goal of providing eviction defense to tenants facing eviction, uh, particularly during this period of the pandemic. Um, An eviction action is called an unlawful detainer. Unlawful meaning you are unlawfully detaining, holding on to a property after the landlord gave you a notice to move out. The eviction process is long and complicated. It starts with a notice of some sort. It can be any amount of days, 3, 15, 30, 60, 90, 120. The notice will say do X or leave, quit, vacate. Different words are used. So a three-day notice to pay rent or quit, three-day notice to cure covenant, stop violating your lease or quit, three-day notice to quit because you've done something so seriously wrong that it cannot be cured or fixed. 30 day notice to quit either because you've done something wrong or because your unit isn't protected by any kind of rent stabilization law. Therefore, we can ask you to just leave without a reason with 30 days because you've been here less than uh, one year or 60 day notice to quit. Again, unit not protected by any kind of rent stabilization law. Therefore, we can ask you to leave on 60 day notice because you've been here a year or more. So notice the eviction process starts with a notice. If the tenant does not do what the notice says to do in the number of days that the notice says to do it, the landlord can go to court and file a complaint. What is a complaint? Exactly what it says. It's the landlord complaining about whatever the allegations of your wrongdoing are. They file the complaint along with a whole bunch of other papers and the court issues them a summons. What is a summons? A summons is a piece of paper issued by a court that gives the court power over the litigants so that the litigants, the landlord who's evicting you and the tenant who the landlord is trying to evict have to do what the court says. Now, particularly during the pandemic, there have been a lot of landlords, a huge increase in both um, harassment and illegal lockouts. In other words, because there are protections right now during the pandemic, the process of evicting someone through court has become more cumbersome and longer. So landlords are either just being so horrifically uh, draconian in their harassment that tenants give up and move out, self-evict, or literally put them out on the street illegally. So we would put that outside of this process, but we have to acknowledge that it is happening. It is illegal. And locking someone out or turning off the utilities is both a violation of civil laws and criminal laws. But these violations are not treated like true crimes 
by either the police or agencies that prosecute. And so landlords are doing it. 352% increase in harassing behavior uh, that includes coming and banging consistently on the door uh, and other like videotaping, installing security cameras that are not really there for the purpose of security, but for the purpose of feeling the tenant, making the feeling the tenant feel invaded um, and other behavior that is more serious like that. Um, and then actual lockout, 75% increase from pre-pandemic numbers. Um, so we have to acknowledge that that could happen, but if the landlord is gonna stay within the legal process, they're gonna file a complaint and the court's gonna issue them a summons. If the tenant does nothing, then a default judgment will be entered, meaning they will lose automatically. And then the notice to vacate will be posted on the door by the sheriff and the sheriff will lock the tenant out. Pre-pandemic, the amount of time from the entry of a default judgment to a lockout was 14 to 21 days. During the pandemic, that's been very unpredictable. It can be way longer because there's changes in the process. And so lawyers and landlords make mistakes and can't get, quite get the paperwork right. But the sheriff is less busy because there are fewer evictions because of the temporary protections. And so once they get it right, it happens a lot faster. So it's become very unpredictable to uh, know how long this is gonna be, this is gonna take. I used to be able to tell tenants who come in with this notice to vacate, it's five days. Let's say you get it and then it takes you three days to find us. So now we've only got two days to get into court or worse yet, you come in after it's expired. I used to be able to tell tenants downtown, sheriff won't come out for about a week. Can't guarantee that, but we have time to get into court. Today, we can get the sheriff, the sheriff can get out there within a day or two. And in the other courts surrounding downtown where there's even fewer cases, often the tenant, the uh, I'm sorry, the sheriff does come out the day after the notice expires. But none of you are going on this route, okay? Uh, you are going on this route, which is you're going to have file an answer. You'll have five working days to file an answer. It's amazing to me how um, like tenants will get the packet of the summons and complaints. And, and I'll ask them, send me the top sheet or send me, usually they've already taken it apart. And there's always a tendency to focus on the sheets that are not the important sheet. The important sheet is the summons. It says that the court has power over you. It also gives you instructions for what you're supposed to do. And yet a lot of people don't even notice it um, or will tell me, no, I never got a summons. And then I'll go through their papers. And in fact, it is in there. Um, five, it tells you you have five working days to answer. You file an answer and then the court will eventually set a trial date and at the trial, you will either win or you will lose. If you win, you get to stay as a tenant. If you lose, you go back into this process where uh, the uh, now it's a judgment, not a default judgment, gets processed. And again, pre-pandemic, from the date you lose to the date of the lockout, 14 to 21 days. Today, a lot, sometimes longer if the landlord or their lawyer can't quite get the process right but once the sheriff has the paperwork much faster because there are fewer cases an important thing to note is this little box is a very tiny tiny box tenant remains in possession often i have clients who want justice and they want uh, to tell the judge their story um, they uh, other things have happened throughout the history of the tenancy that they want vindication for. They've been harassed. The utilities were turned off. Um, they were reported to the police. They've been trying to illegally lock me out. Very often those things have nothing to do with the eviction case. So for instance, if I, you have a three-day notice to quit and you are accused of assaulting a neighbor or threatening someone, 
But before you got to that assault, there were a whole bunch of other things that happened. If you actually assaulted a neighbor, well, that's a nuisance. And there's probably no defense other than self-defense. And therefore, unless you can say that at that very moment you were defending yourself, you can't talk about the entire history about how the neighbor and the landlord have been making you crazy uh, by blasting music day and night so that you'll move out. Because, and I had this case, uh, my client lived in a below market unit uh, apartment, rent controlled. The landlord had been trying to get her out for many, many, many years. She suspected that the landlord deliberately moved in a young couple, couple beneath her apartment in the unit below so that they would make her crazy and leave. And they had parties Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every week. And this was an older person. And the party would go on until two or three in the morning. Well, one night she decided she was going to get back at them. So when the party ended, she started blasting music to keep them up. And then she did it the next day and it happened for a couple of weekends. They had this sort of dueling parties, uh, but the security guards at the premises took the tenant side. Why? Maybe because they were in cahoots with the landlord. The whole purpose was to get her to voluntary vacate, or maybe because nobody, she was the only one complaining about the, the music for the party and all the neighbors were complaining about when she was blasting music after the party. One night, the people downstairs came upstairs when she started blasting the music. The security guards were called, ruckus happens, and all of the neighbors come out to this deck, this, um, this um, sort of outside balcony. She is inside and the security guard is demanding that she come out um, and she gets scared. She opens the wooden door, she opens the security door with a bat in her hand, she feels threatened, even though no one's really approaching her, they're just yelling, and she starts swinging the bat at people. Uh, ultimately, the court found that her behavior was a nuisance. Why? Because when she stepped out from the safety of her own apartment, it stopped being self-defense. When she stepped out and started swinging the bat at the neighbors, it became an assault and therefore it was a nuisance. She was also threatening them. Uh, I'm gonna kill you all, I'm gonna kill you all. And so therefore that's a case that we lost. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we won a similar case where a young man had been being harassed by a neighbor this one I think was just motivated by the neighbor's racism. Um, the young man, after many, many months of dealing with derogatory uh, racist terms, one day comes home, the neighbor starts yelling at him. He takes his groceries, puts them in, in, uh, inside, grabs a baseball bat and comes downstairs to talk to the neighbor. Um, he, the lawsuit was about his coming to approach the neighbor with the baseball bat, but he, he didn't actually swing it. And, um, and so we argued that the behavior was not a nuisance, that he had the bat with him for protection, but he didn't assault anyone. He didn't batter anyone and therefore not a nuisance. And we won. Um, and in that case, we were able to talk about the background and what led to him wanting to go downstairs holding a bat. Uh, but if he had swung the bat and made contact, the outcome would have been different. What we were able to establish there is that there wasn't a nuisance at all, okay? Um, so uh, that those are two examples where the the both of those tenants wanted justice. They wanted to tell their story. They wanted the other person to be evicted. They wanted compensation. Don't get that. You don't get that in an eviction case. The eviction case is really about whether or not the tenant gets to stay as a tenant. If you want compensation for something that's been happening, uh, you have to file a separate lawsuit against whoever it is that is doing you wrong. Okay. 
So the, the, this next chart is the same process with more steps in it. One of the things I want you to note in this chart is at every stage of the game, we can negotiate. Every stage of the game, we can negotiate. So the eviction process is long and complicated and with a lawyer tenancy success 98% of the time. This is not a guarantee. It just shows you though, that we do know what we're doing. Uh, but your case could easily be part of the 2%. Success is measured as either winning the lawsuit and you get to stay or a settlement that is favorable to the tenant. Usually a settlement means moving out with enough time, with the rent forgiven so that you can use it to move, sometimes with money and a clean record. So let's go over the eviction process again. Uh, the eviction process again starts with a notice and it can be any number of days to do something or quit. Another way of saying quit is move out, vacate, leave. If the tenant does not do what that notice says within the number of days, the only thing that the landlord can legally do is file a complaint and then the court will issue a summons, which gives power over both parties so that the court can decide who is right, who is wrong. The court sends out a courtesy notice, a courtesy notice as soon as the complaint is filed. One is mailed to the tenant, anybody else who's named in the complaint as living there, and one goes out to all unnamed occupants. It goes out in English and in Spanish, and I'm gonna show you a picture of it. That courtesy notice goes out by mail. It's two pages and it will either arrive before the landlord gets around to handing you a 15, 20, 30, 35 page packet with the summons, the complaints, any evidence and a bunch of other court forms. The courtesy notice sometimes comes after you already have that packet. You have five working days from when you get the packet delivered to you to file an answer. Now, we don't mess around. The moment we know there is a lawsuit, we go ahead and file an answer. So right here in this little box, tenant files motions. There are lawyers who believe that if the packet isn't delivered correctly, we should go to court and do a motion to quash service. We don't do that. Why don't we do that? Because then the landlord just serves you. You get an extra 10 days. It's a lot of work. Why bother? The judges also get irritated because it bottles up the system. And frankly, I don't think that it is worth it to for the extra 10 days to force the landlord to do it right um, when it annoys the judges and then makes the whole case a little harder the rest of the of the litigation. There's also something called a demur and a motion to strike. A demur says, hey, they made mistakes inside. They gave it to me, but the complaint has errors. And so you file this demur. The, usually they just get denied, but if it's granted, they have 20 days to fix their mistake and start again. Again, not worth it in my view. Um, our resources are limited. Pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, uh, when we were first founded, 73,000 evictions were filed in LA County in 2002. 73,000. And of the 73,000, about 1,800 people got representation. 99% of the tenants that did not go to court, with 99% of tenants that go to court without a lawyer lose their cases. So the scarce resources have to be used efficiently. And I figured out that the amount of time we were spending on doing these motions, we could help for four motions, uh, help one more family. So we stopped doing these motions. And uh, there are 11 legal services programs in LA County that represent people for free, 11 nonprofits. None of them do motions to quash. Some of them still do demurs, although I'm trying to explain to them why that's not 
helpful to either their client or to um, or to the tenants that are not getting help because of the time being spent on motions that just force the landlord to correct their errors. So what was the point? We jump straight to filing an answer and then immediately propound discovery. If you know that you want to move and you know where you're going to move and you have a very specific plan that is foolproof, we'll make a settlement offer at the same time we serve the answer and the discovery. Serve means deliver or mail. Then if it isn't accepted, we go through this discovery process. Discovery just simply means that both sides have a right to ask the other side bunches of questions. Questions about the case, what the evidence is against the other party, um, what we have a right to demand all of the evidence. That would be the emails, the texts, photographs, videos, papers, anything that you have in the uh, that is about the case, you have to turn over to the other side. Um, you can also be brought in for a deposition, which is uh, a process that happens inside, usually one of the lawyer's offices in front of a court reporter where um, they take your testimony under penalty of perjury. So that's discovery. Then eventually the other side will request a trial. And under the law, there's supposed to be a notice of hearing and a trial within 20 days of this request. In fact, since pre-pandemic times, the system has been very bottled up. Why? Because our agency increased the amount of representation from 1,800 to 5,000. And as representation goes up, filings go down because it is more costly for the landlords to bring the cases. And so we have a reduction in filing. So by 2019, the year before the pandemic started, we had the numbers down to about 49,000 from 73,000 filings a year. It's still 3,381 filings a month. It's still a lot of evictions. We were representing about 500 uh, families, an improvement, but not a, it's not by far problem solved. After the pandemic started, a series of protections that a lot of people call moratoria, but they are not. So please don't use the word moratorium. A moratorium is a ban on something. So a moratorium on evictions would be a ban on evictions. Um, so we do not, we don't have a ban on evictions. Evictions can be filed. There are protections and the protections resulted in a reduction in evictions. The protections that we had in place between April 7th, 2020 and October 5th, 2020, reduced the number of filings from 3,381 a month to 458 a month, which is huge. And then we lost the most important protection in October. We got some state protection that was weaker. And that state protection then resulted in the number of filings going up to about 1,000 a month. Way better than, than 3,381, but it still it went in the wrong direction in my view. But in any event, we have um, protections still in place. Some of those state protections disappeared on October 1st of this year. And we're still waiting to see what the impact is going to be on the number of filings. But um, uh, we're waiting to see what the impact is going to be on the number of filings. Uh, we are noticing that there's an uptick in filings. So, um, so pre-pandemic, instead of 20 days, it was taking a total of eight months to go from here through here. So huge amount of time to go from here to here. During the pandemic, because we demand um, jury trials and because we, um, because the courts are backed up, 
So it's actually a combination of both sides of the bar, the landlord lawyers and the tenant lawyers. It's a high volume practice for both sides. So often we get to court and the um, uh, we get to court and the other side is um, not ready or we are not ready. We have another case. And because we have another case, it gets continued. And then sometimes we have to court on both sides already, but there's no judge available. Um, so this is the, the, this is causing huge amounts of delay. We do not do things just for the sake of delay, but we do acknowledge that delay helps our clients because it makes the litigation more costly to the other side. And so it makes the other side more amenable, more open to settlement, including settlement where the tenant gets to stay. Right now, we are settling a lot of cases with pay and stay using the rental assistance money from the state. If you have not paid rent for reasons related to COVID, and that's a very broad definition, you should be applying for the state rental assistance. And let me change that. You must apply for the state rental assistance at housingiskey.com. And, um, and um, for two reasons. First, because it'll take care of what your rent debt, your COVID-19 related rent debt. And also because it comes with some eviction protection once the application is approved, the case can't move forward in the courts. Um, and again, here, if there is a trial, judgment for tenant, the tenant stays. Judgment for landlord, it brings you back into this Sheriff posts a five day notice to vacate, uh, 14 to 21 day scenario, more unpredictable during the pandemic, longer to get to the place where the tenant posts the five day notice to vacate. But once that last notice is posted, Sheriff much faster at getting you out. There are motions that can be done here if a judgment is entered against you. Our success rate, if you come to us early in the game, 98%. Our success rate, if you come to us late in the game, less than 10% the last time I counted. Um, less than 10%, the last time we did figures pre-pandemic, I will say that we've been having better luck because there have been more protections during the pandemic and the judges are more tuned into the fact that you cannot comply with stay at home orders if you don't have a home to stay in. So we are seeing a higher success rate, but it's still a long shot. So do not get on this track. Again, negotiation possible even after you lose because the threat of appeal, especially if it's a realistic threat, is a way to get the landlord um, to um, come on the right track. At this moment, uh, I've got a, a couple of people who say they can't get in and I'm gonna just gonna tell them to come back next week because I don't wanna interrupt the recording. Uh, okay, so when you come to our, I, I wanna say a little bit about why we're doing these webinars. Okay, 98% um, of tenants who end up in eviction actions think they're special. And you know what? You're not more special than the person on the screen next to you. All the cases are special. 98% uh, will tell me my case is different. Yeah, maybe it is, but your needs are, you know, really it's a big club. Nearly a half a million people are at risk of eviction in LA County right now. And so what we need is for people to be educated and empowered and to recognize that we are in a, that we are sh in a ship on a storm, that we're taking in water, that most of the crew of the ship is in the water, helping people who have fallen in already and that we need your help if we are all going to survive. So one of the things that I want people to start being is so self-interested and so self-centered that they're the guy on the ship that would put everybody at risk to save themselves. 
We need to help save everyone. Um, and that means getting educated, listening at the presentations. You're not going to get it the first time. I met with clients this week. I'm not sure if they're on the if they're on right now, but I met with them and we invited them to these presentations months ago when the first that went when their uh, case was first opened. They were frustrated by what they felt was a lack of communication um, because they did not understand exactly how things work. Why? Because I expect you to know all of this if you are my client. You're invited day one. I invite you to come every single Saturday at nine o'clock. If you can't make it, the recordings are on YouTube. And if you do, instead of being uh, timid or uninformed or nervous, anxious client, you will become an empowered actor in the situation, able to contribute meaningfully because you'll know what the limitations are and what the, what the possibilities are. Um, and you will have a much, much better result. So um, another example, and I think these folks are here, I got a call on Friday from three people who have a notice to vacate that expires, I forget, but I think on Monday. Um, I don't have a lawyer to do that notice to vacate paperwork. I asked them to do X, Y, Z so that I could guide them through the process. And today they asked me if the presentation was mandatory. Yes, it's mandatory. If I am going to take part of my weekend to help someone who I really don't have time to help because we already have too many of them, yes, I do not want to explain this to you individually. I want you to understand all of this. It is way uh, more efficient for me to explain all of this to 30 people in one setting than to explain it 30 times. And so that's why these webinars are essential. And um, Kevin will put them up uh, on the chat. This one on Saturday, I always do. I do the presentation, I do the Q&A, and I think it's one that everybody should go to because you get a level of detail that you don't get at the other ones. On Tuesday, it is in Spanish and it is a general presentation on tenant rights. Thursday, the same thing. And Saturday at one o'clock, also general presentation. We've been trying to figure out how to add more presentations. Um, I think what we're gonna start doing is recording the presentations, inviting people to come, putting the recording on, and then when the recording is over, doing some Q&A, because we really should have much more um, content for people. The presentations are long. This one's on the eviction process in general. We should have one on rent control laws. We should have a separate one on landlord harassment. We should have a separate one on the COVID-19 eviction protections, and people should have access to all of that information so that they can make good, clear decisions. And this is the decision that you're going to be asked to make. You're already in a problem with your landlord. Your landlord wants to out, wants you out. That is not comfortable, not for anybody. But when you come in to our office, we ask you to make a choice. The road to the left is the I'm getting out of here road. I'm sorry, no. The road to the left is the I am staying. I am staying to fight for my housing. I am staying to fight for my community. I will not be part of what fuels displacement and gentrification. I'm staying. I am fighting. That's the road to the left. The road to the right is, huh, I already have problems with my landlord. I don't want to be in a situation where I'm living with problems with my landlord. I want to get out, but I need X amount of time so I can find a place, X amount of money in either saved rent or new money given to me for relocation and a sealed record. That's the road to the right. And, and then your job is to figure out what the X is, right? How much time, how much money do you need to get out of there? Um, you choose your road and then we assess whether your path is realistic. So for instance, if you are someone who um, did actually commit the nuisance that you're accused of, 
and you are paying market rate for your unit. And maybe right now we can keep you in because of all the extra COVID protections and the delays in the courts. But eventually, we're not going to be able to keep you in because you really did threaten to kill the neighbor and then break into their apartment. Uh, then that case, ultimately, even though you want to stay, probably needs to ultimately go on this move out road. Um, on the other hand, I have had clients who are in extremely below market rate units, didn't do anything wrong. It's all fabricated. Maybe we can prove it. Maybe we can't. But at least we have their testimony that this isn't so. And we can put at issue the landlord's side of the story uh, because the landlord's been trying to get them out for years and years. Then that tenant should probably be on the um, on the pan stay. So you choose your path. And then you, um, we assess whether your path is realistic, okay? There are 16 factors that we consider in addressing whether your path is realistic. The first is the value of your unit. How much is your rent for how much space in what neighborhood? The value of your unit. And is the unit protected? Protected by what? Well, usually by a rent stabilization ordinance. What is a rent stabilization ordinance? More commonly referred to as rent control, which is really a misnomer, uh, rent stabilization provides the tenant protection from eviction. Each law says these are the reasons that someone can be evicted. Usually there are fault reasons. The tenant did something wrong and no fault evictions. The landlord wants to do something else with the unit. Rent stabilization laws also dictate when and how much the rent can go up, how much notice, what percentage. And rent stabilization laws protect amenities. What's an amenity? Something that's not required by the law, such as a parking space, laundry room, um, recreation room, swimming pool, jacuzzi. If you have an amenity and the landlord wants to take it away, each law says whether they can or can't and how they have to compensate you if they do. I mean, you can imagine if you live in Venice and you have a parking space, in fact, this is true all over this city now, but a, a parking space in Venice is like gold. Otherwise, you could be parking 10 blocks away from your house every night. And if the landlord takes that away from you, then it makes the value of your unit significantly less. Um, and it is often taking away a parking space is often used as a way to try to get rid of the tenant. Unfortunately, most rent stabilization laws allow amenities to be removed as long as the tenant is compensated in LA, that is, uh, that is what is allowed. So I've got tons of people right now who are fighting for their garage or their parking space because in their neighborhood, that's, it's not just about not having a place to store your stuff. You're not going, going to be able to, you're going to have to park your, your car on the street far away or in an unsafe space. And then therefore it's going to motivate you to try to move out. So amenities can be very, very important. So rent, stabilization laws. Um, Kevin, can you stop the recording for a second? So rent stabilization laws. The difference between rent stabilization and rent control is what happens to the unit when a tenant moves out. When there is true rent control, if a tenant moves out, no matter the reason, Tenant moves out voluntarily, tenant moves out because the landlord harassed them, tenant moves out because they did something wrong. The rent for the next tenant stays the same. Under rent control, the landlord loses the motivation to harass tenants or evict tenants because they're not going to make any money out of it. Rent control or vacancy control is the holy grail for the landlord lobby. 
they will spend $70 million to stop a law that will allow us to impose rent control. In fact, the reason we have a state rent stabilization ordinance is because in 2018, uh, three organizations, including the Eviction Defense Network, the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, and the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, launched a campaign for a law that would eliminate the law that stops rent control from being passed. We spent $32 million, they spent $75 million to defeat us. Immediately after uh, we lost, ACE, the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, launched a campaign for state rent control. And I have to tell you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the ACE Institute board. I'm a member of the ACE family. I support her to the core, but I thought, oh my God, we just had this huge defeat. How could they possibly think we can have a victory? But they did think we could have a victory and we did get a victory. And what they were thinking is the landlord lobby doesn't want us to come back with another um, attempt to get rid of vacancy control so we can get some protection for people. And we got the Tenant Protection Act, which was passed in late 2019 and went into effect January 1st, 2020. I can tell you that before the pandemic, we had these clinics in person on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. 45 people show up to a clinic, 40 of them had three day notice, uh, 30 day notices to quit or 60 day notice to quit, no reason, or huge rent increases and no protection. There was no way to keep them in because there was no protection. Today, most tenants in California are protected by that statewide rent stabilization law. It isn't as strong as we want it to be. There are three significant loopholes in it. A lot of people will fall through the cracks of that law, but most tenants in California are protected. And that law could have been stronger if more people had been fighting for it. And it could get uh, improved if people get involved. So I urge you to join organizations like the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment. Kevin will put their information in the chat right now. And also Tenants Together, which is another statewide organization and your tenant unions. Um, join, get active. It's how we get better laws. People often ask me, well, what's in it for me? Well, in the long run, protection is in it for you. But the, the real issue is not what's in it for you, but how can you help improve the situation in general for tenants? Tenants need to acknowledge that as a group, they have huge amounts of power because there are more tenants, more votes, than there are landlords, but landlords a recognize that they have a economic interest and organize and contribute money and buy votes. Uh, and so what we not buy votes in terms of bribes, although I'm sure that does happen too, but the landlord lobby can target an elected official and they won't get reelected. And so the elected officials are afraid of the landlord lobby. They should be afraid of the tenant lobby so that we can get the protection that ten tenants need. And that will not happen unless you bring your grain of sand to the battle and contribute. Besides rent control or rent stabilization, tenants are sometimes protected by the laws that govern whatever subsidy the landlord might have gotten to build the unit. So if you live in a subsidized building or what is sometimes called low income housing or public housing or have a section eight voucher, which is a piece of paper that the government gives you so that your landlord is paid part of the rent by you and part of the rent by the government. There are federal laws that then offer you some protection. Um, and then sometimes, although this is rare, we have an unexpired lease. So a lease is an agreement to rent for a particular number of months. The most common in a residential tenancy is six months. A year is also very common. Multiple year, year residential leases are very unusual. And usually when we see them, the landlord claims that they are fraudulent. But the, the bottom line is that if you have an unexpired lease, it could provide some protection. And even an expired lease, every time that you pay your rent, 
even though the lease has been in the bottom drawer somewhere for 42 years, every time you pay your rent, that lease is viable for a month uh, or for whatever, the, if you pay the rent week to week, then for a week, but usually it's a month for a month. And so it could offer some protections, but it also could offer the landlord reasons to evict you, but we need to know one way or the other. So the value of the unit and is the unit protected of the first two factors that we consider. The next thing we look at is, can we win? Can we win? So does the law protect us? Is there a defense that is available to this tenant? Suppose the tenant is, this is a pre-pandemic case, three day notice to pay rent or quit. Um, tenant didn't pay the rent. The first thing we look at is, are there any bad conditions that can be used to justify a rent reduction? We can win that case. Does the notice demand no more, not one penny more than the tenant actually owes? If it demands too much, then the notice is defective. Did the landlord put all the things in the notice that they're supposed to put? Who to pay, where to pay, phone number for the, of the person to pay, hours of operation, anything of that missing? That's a technical defense. Is there anything else that's wrong with the notice? Was it handed to them? And if they weren't home, was it handed to somebody else? And if no one was home, was it properly posted on the door and sent by mail? If there's a problem with service, that's a defense. So we're looking at, is there a defense, number one? Number two, can we prove it? Can we prove that this defense exists? So the tenant claims, oh, I don't owe this money. I already paid it. How did you pay it? Oh, I always pay in cash. Did you get a receipt? No, I didn't. Well, then you didn't pay it because you're not going to be able to prove it. Uh, it makes the case a gazillion times harder to prove. And I'm not saying that we never win those cases because we recently did win one where the jury found it not credible that the landlord allowed someone to stay in the unit for I think seven years without any compensation and the tenant claimed to have paid his rent in cash. They were friends. But so we can win, but it's a lot harder to win without evidence. Testimony as evidence, but physical evidence, receipts, et cetera, are very important. In the can we win category is, how good are the witnesses on both sides? How good is our client? Are they a good storyteller? Can they follow instructions? Can they listen to our admonition or our request that they answer the question, only the question? Um, that is how you testify, right? In court, if you are asked, do you know what color the sky is right now? I want you to answer that question to yourselves right now. Do you know what color the sky is right now? There are two possible answers to that question. Yes or no, but most people will say blue. They will all say blue even if they don't know what color the sky is, right? We're inside. I think I can see that it's a little gray right now, but people will answer blue because the sky usually is blue. So that means you didn't listen to the question. If we want to know what color you think the sky is, we'll ask you, what color is the sky? Blue. If I'm the other lawyer and we've been inside for two hours, I'm going to put holes in that statement because how do you know it's blue? We're inside, there's no windows, could have gotten cloudy in between. Are you making this up? Are you lying? Are you lying now? Were you lying when you told us bloody bloody 10 minutes ago? See what I mean? So you have to really be careful when you testify and be a good witness. Another part of being a good witness, and I like to say this now, when, we, when I interview you either today or on Monday or after the one o'clock presentation today, you are going to want to tell me your story you're going to want to tell me way more than I need because that's just human nature. And you are going to want to bark it at me, most of you. By that, I mean is you're going to take an angry tone as you're telling me the story because when you talk about this, it pisses you off and your emotions get in the way. And this is how you talk about it. And can you, can you see how it is a lot more 
difficult to listen to someone that's barking at you. So it's hard on the advocates, right? I spend my whole day talking to tenants and I swear I'm developing PTSD from it because I spend the whole day being barked at. And when I ask people not to do that, most of them think I'm just being insensitive because obviously people are angry and barking because they're anxious, upset, they have a right to be angry. Um, so part of the reason I need you to practice doing this is because advocates are really, um, it, it is harder for us to hear you when you're barking your story. But the other reason is that you will not be liked by the jury if you talk in a way that is angry. You have to really learn how to tell your story in a passionate but level tone. If you're not barking, you'll whine through the story. Also very unlikable. Again, it comes out of a sense of defeat, right? People who are not feeling strong and, or, or, and powerful will either be angry or complaining, but it isn't attractive. And so you need to be, your voice needs to be as attractive as possible Every study shows that someone that talks in a low timber like this one, this is not my natural voice. My natural voice is a little bit more shrill and a little bit faster and more excitable. I have to control myself to talk like this. And I do it because I know it's easier to hear me when this is my tone. Okay. Um, the third alternative is the indignant. Um, and one of the things that's extremely unattractive is someone who hasn't paid their rent and is indignant about it. So please watch your tone. And what I will tell you as you're talking is watch your tone. And what that means is say exactly the same thing you just told me, but don't bark it, don't whine it, and don't sound indignant. You will be way, way more likable. Uh, another element of are you a good witness is how are you dressed, right? Business casual is what we need, right? We don't need you in a big fancy party dress. We don't need you. I once asked my client, please dress nicely. And she came in a cocktail dress. No, we don't need a cocktail dress. We don't need Easter Sunday. We need relatively conservative looking, um, well, you know, business casual look for, for folks. Um, men should not wear full suit and tie but a button down shirt with a tie is nice. And uh, women can either be in a dress or in a nice pantsuit, business casual is what we're looking for. When you show up in court in jeans, sweats, uh, tank tops, t-shirts, you're sending a message to the judge and the jury that this isn't important to you. Now we do end up with sort of difficulties or um, sort of political conflict here a little bit. So I once represented a uh, young man who was, had a lot of tattoos and body art and the, you know, and a mohawk and these, uh, you know, earlobes elongated, et cetera. And normally that's just not gonna sit well with most jurors, right? Jurors are people who are, especially at the time, cause now that everyone's registered to vote, our jury pool is way, way more diverse. But at the time, jurors were primar primarily conservative retired people um, because you actually have to register, had to register to vote in order to be on the jury polls and because um, it was a lot easier to get off a jury. Now it's impossible to get off a jury. Everybody has to serve. And that's important. Why? Because we want jurors to be representative of the population. We don't want jurors to be the conservative retired person that has time to serve. We want it to be diverse, uh, but hard to get a group of uh, jurors that's going to accept someone that is as counterculture as this. But he wouldn't uh, change his hairdo. He wouldn't, he wasn't gonna be put in a box. Uh, and I had to respect that as long as he understood the risks. Similarly, uh, wonderfully, Liberace style flamboyant gay man that, you know, especially at the time now, you know, being gay is very last year. Uh, there is a high level of acceptance of gay people thanks to the fact that there are so many uh, famous gay people like Ellen DeGeneres made huge strides for, for uh, the LGBT community. 
but the prejudice still exists against people who are at the two extremes. Very butch women are still. Um, uh, Liz, can you please mute? Higher incidence of violence and also very effeminate gay men. So for folks that are at, uh, that are different, that look different from what we uh, as a culture think men and women should be, including trans folk, uh, people who have uh, are transitioning from one gender to another, there's still a high level of danger, prejudice on the streets and in the courtroom. So my client who's given name was a very girly name, but was a trans man transitioning from a woman to a man. And the whole case rested on credibility. It was a tough decision, uh, but she wouldn't get put, she would, you know, I explained the risks. She, he, I'm sorry, did not want to go back in the closet, wanted to present even though the documents had her uh, given name didn't want to, what insisted on using her chosen, his chosen name. And you see how I am married to a trans man. I am, uh, I live with someone I am married to for 28 years with, to someone whose preferred gender pronoun right now is they, but was she when we first got together. And I have difficulty keeping the gender pronoun of my trans man uh, client at he. And that's because the prejudices are so deeply ingrained that we have to constantly wor be working against uh, to work them out. I can tell you that when I brought this issue up to the jury, when I asked the jury whether I started with gay and everybody's fine with gay, gay is fine. But then when I brought the trans man issue, I swear the entire jury box looked like a Dodger game people doing the wave. Everybody's um, body move, shifted because they were uncomfortable. So I knew that there was gonna be difficulty there because they were uncomfortable. These are very real things, right? Same thing goes if you're more attractive, if you're conventionally attractive, you're gonna do better in trial than if you're not conventionally attractive. So we, and it's wrong, but it is, and we have to be aware of it. Um, the next thing, so we've covered already value of the unit. Is the unit protected? Can we win because the law is on our side? We have the evidence. Our client is a good witness. Um, it's going to be likable, etc. And then we go to other leverage. Other leverage are things like, are you coming to us the day before your trial? Or do we have time to do a good answer, propound discovery, make a demand for a jury trial, prepare the case. Obviously, we're gonna have a much better result if you come to us from the beginning because we're gonna be better prepared. But if you also come to us from the beginning, we're gonna be able to do discovery and a jury demand, which is, we do it because that's how you win, but it also puts pressure on the landlord to settle on the terms that you are asking for because it makes the litigation more expensive for the landlord. The other leverage point is an attorney's fees provision in the contract. Is there an unlimited attorney's fees provision in the contract? You look at your lease, it's usually one of the last paragraphs, and it will say, in the event of a lawsuit, the loser has to pay the winner's fees. Even if it says the tenant has to pay the landlord's fees, which sometimes they do, it's interpreted as the loser has to pay the winner's fees. Sometimes it has a cap, 500, 1,000, $1,500 cap. Sometimes it doesn't have a cap at all. This is leverage. It's a double-edged sword with the edge sharper on our side to get what you want. Why? Because if we win, we're not gonna get just a couple of thousand dollars. We could get, I've had a $65,000 attorney fees award in the past, okay? So other leverage, attorney fee provision. So, so far we've covered the value of the unit, how much is the rent, um, how many bedrooms, what neighborhood, is it below market? 
And is it protected? Usually we're looking at rent stabilization protection. We have a state law. There are also local laws in nine jurisdictions in LA County. Is your unit protected by one of those laws? Can we win because the law's on our side and we have the evidence and our client is gonna be a good witness and likable? Other leverage, discovery, jury demand, unlimited attorney's fees. Next thing we look at is, um, here it says client finances, but it's really other equities. And I'll be honest with you, I actually look at other equities up here. By other equities, I mean, um, is this a disabled mother with six children on AFDC and CalFresh, which even if we lose this case, they'll never be able to collect from? Or is this an upwardly mobile person or someone with means who had a temporary downturn, has a job with a paycheck that can be garnished and whose credit history is gonna make more of a difference to them. That disabled mother with six kids living on government benefits, their credit history shot anyways, right? So um, someone who is upwardly mobile has a job, can be that they can collect from their job, et cetera, has to be more um, cautious about how they handle this. Um, when I'm deciding what to do, part of these client finance question is, how hard is it gonna be for this family to be placed somewhere to find new housing? Um, and I'll, I like to do this by telling stories. And what you, the, the, this presentation is pretty much the same every week, it's the same format, but the, I try to change the stories. So let me tell you the story of a building that I represented many years ago. They came to us at a clinic and there were, I think, something like 40 families when they first came in. It was not rent stabilized. It was before the state law and it was in the city of Los Angeles, but built after October of 1978. An apartment building in order to be covered in LA has to be built before October of 1978. Why? Most laws have different start dates. Usually it's the date that the law was passed. Everything after the law is passed, exempt. Um, and so, and then there's also a lot of other things that go into what the start date is that is more complicated and that we need to get to right now. But uh, in any event, in LA, not protected. And they had 60 day notices to quit, no cause. That's a legal notice. Why did the landlord serve these notices? because there was a systematic code inspection and he asked them all to not be home uh, because the plan was to guide the landlord to the three units and uh, the inspector to the three units that he had already fixed and pretend that everybody else just shined on the notice. And the tenants neither organized against that nor cooperated. If they were home, they were home, they let the inspector in. If they weren't home, they weren't home. They didn't, the inspector didn't go in and the landlord got mad that they, that they were not cooperating with his demand that they stay, that only those three tenants be home, okay? So that's our case. Now, when they first came in, I told them the notice is legal. Your only defense is retaliation. Here is the theory. I think it's a very hard retaliation case because it's not yet like you organized, you just didn't, you didn't do anything, right? You just, it's not like you uh, specifically made a decision not to cooperate. You just happen to not be home. Um, so I recommended that people look for housing during the 60 day period. And out of the 40 some odd families that had come in, all but 11 found a place to go. So who was I left with? The very large families, right? families that were living in one and two bedrooms, but really needed three bedrooms. Families that were very low income, the market was starting to change. And so people who had been there for a while were paying relatively low rents and couldn't afford rent on the market. People who were disabled, therefore had a harder time, both because they have less money and because they're less mobile to go looking, elderly people. So that's what generally happens in these situations is 
If you can move, most people just move. But if you can't move because your income is low or because you have a mobility issue or a digital divide issue, which makes it harder to find housing, uh, or because your income is low and your rent is low, then that's when we end up uh, having to fight for your housing. And that's where client finances takes a big role. During the pandemic, our position is nobody moves unless they have a place to go. And that's because the protections that we have are allowing us to take that position, even with the hardest to win cases. But as the pandemic ends and as our protections start to go to be reduced, we're having to tell people you really need to start looking because eventually these protections that are keeping you here and that are temporary are going to go away. And so we have to start looking for a place to go and making a plan, even if that plan is some temporary couch surfing in these places for X number of months um, while I save some extra money and move out. Okay. So we've got the value of the unit, how many bedrooms, how, you know, the size of the unit, amount, neighborhood that it's in, what's it worth, is it below market? We've got, is it protected? Usually that's a question about rent stabilization protection. Can we win? Does the law support our position? Do we have the evidence? Is our client likable? Other leverage, like the ability to prepare the case. Client fi finances, size of the family, income, source of income, disability, age, et cetera. And, um, what are, and the next thing is, what are we risking? Um, so uh, I'll give you three examples here. And these I have used before, but I think that they're the most illustrative. In example number one, the tenant's rent is in the four or $500 range for a uh, two bedroom apartment rent controlled in Los Angeles has been there for 42 years but the tenant did breach the lease. And I don't think we can win the case. On the other hand, the breach is like a nominal thing and not a, not, it's not like they you know, threatened to kill someone or hit someone. Um, so I think that the judge might grant, if we lose the case, a hardship motion to allow the tenant to stay because she's elderly, very low income, very low rent, rent stabilized. But it's a chance, right? The judge may also not think that someone who breached the lease has a right to stay there. So frankly, for the first, I've represented this woman for so long. Um, this is the second attempt to evict her. We won the first case, but in the second case is where there was a problem. But the second case has been going on since before the pandemic um, started. And suddenly, the landlord has offered $75,000 for her to move. Now we're risking something, right? We're risking something on a case that we don't think we can win and that um, that we can, and that maybe, maybe not, we get to stay as a hardship motion if we lose with a huge maybe. Those, you know, we don't often win those motions. So now we're have to, having to see whether we should risk that. In my second example, I was helping someone living in Venice, six units, I think it was four units being demolished to build six luxury condos. And um, my client was the last one and we had a technical defense. So we were gonna likely win this case. There's no guarantees, but my educated opinion was that we would win this case, forcing them to serve a new 120 day notice that would have then, even if she decided to move within the new 120 days, cost them their construction loan. If they lose the construction loan, I had someone that was a developer look at it, it would have cost them about 300,000 300, in delays, et cetera. And so I figured I can get this woman $200,000 to move, right? Because you're gonna lose three, why not put in two? Well, negotiations start. And when we got at to $100,000 in new money and 33,000 in saved rent, my client 
took that deal. Was it a good deal? Sure, it got her into home ownership. Could I have done better? Probably. I think we could have gotten close to uh, 150 in new money, maybe 200 in new, uh, in new money. Um, but not my decision, right? I'm not the one that's risking $100,000 and 33000 in waived rent. So I honored, which is my duty and my obligation as a lawyer, my client's um, wishes. And frankly, once they started, when we had them at 75, I, well, I told her, I think we can get higher. I also did not discourage her from taking the deal because the landlord could have just said, the developer could have just said, okay, fine. I'm not giving you that. I'll just start a, a, all over and take my chances, uh, you know, and, and, and take the losses, right? So negotiation is a combination of playing poker, chicken, and let's make a deal. And you have to know how to play all three games. And I am actually very good at paying all three, uh, playing all th three games. I recently had a case where my client had a very good case because of pandemic protections. But again, those are ending and they were willing to give her money that she wouldn't be entitled to. This was a Tenant Protection Act protected unit the relocation assistance under the Tenant Protection Act is nominal. It's a month's rent. They were offering her $25,000 and enough time to move. So had we not taken the deal, we would have won this case. And then they would have had to start all over after the pandemic. So she would have gotten a lot more time to move, but she wouldn't have gotten the $25,000. Um, they started by offering 2000 and we inched them up to 25. My educated opinion was that they weren't going to go much higher than 25. Um, and she ended up taking the deal. But the way that that deal went, went through, we continued the case eight times and kept our move out offer of, I think it was something like 120 days from the date you accept and $25,000. We kept that on the table. The case actually, after, I don't know, seven, eight, nine appearances, got sent out to a trial judge. And they still kept telling us that they would only, I forget, like something like $10,000 and much less time. And we just kept our offer on the table. We had our meeting with our trial judge that we came back the next day. Our jury was literally lined up when opposing counsel, who is a kind of cocky young man, leans over to me, violating social distancing protocols, and gives me two thumbs up. And I said to him, first of all, get back on your side of the table and use your words, dude. What does that mean? We'll take your deal, okay? And why did that happen? Because in the game of poker, chicken, and let's make a deal, my client stuck to her guns and then got the deal she wanted. And then the last example I'm going to give you is one that most people will think is not a good deal. I once settled the case for three weeks to move, three weeks. That's the 14 to 21 days is what it takes to kick someone out if you lose. Three weeks to move. Payment of all the rent, which was a huge amount of money on a payment plan and a sealed record. And why did I take that deal? Because when I looked at all of these factors with my client, the value of the unit, luxury unit in Marina Del Rey, not protected, uh, huge, huge rent, like $4,500 way a long time ago. I mean, this was like in the 90s, $4,500 was a huge, huge, it was a you know big fancy building in Mar Marina Del Rey. My client was a mortgage broker investment counselor who had lost his job, gone through his savings, and then gotten into eviction proceedings, but he'd just gotten a new job. Luxury unit, there was not one defense in this case. He had not even a missing electrical outlet. We had marked plumbing problems because he had a, a, a leak uh, in his um, kitchen sink, like a little drip, not a breach of warranty of habitability, but gave us the right to mark that box. We weren't gonna win on it. Um, and um, otherwise not anything wrong at all with the notice. It demanded the right amount, didn't have any defects, no rent control defenses, nothing. So we were gonna lose, he was gonna be out in three weeks with an eviction on his record. 
he had just gotten a job. No one's going to hire a financial counselor mortgage broker that has an eviction on their record. So the sealed record was the most important thing to this person. Therefore, that was a good deal for that person given all of these consequences. Okay. Um, I'll tell you guys another story just because I think people really learn from the stories. I once had a case where a landlord in Venice advertised two for the price of one, two units on the lot, uh, but he wanted to rent the two units as one lease. That's a little unusual. So is it one tenant or is it um, one, te it's one tenancy, but it's still two units. Um, these three actors move in, two male actors into the main house, female actor into the uh, accessory dwelling unit. Well, the accessory dwelling unit was not permitted. So she's living in an un unpermitted part, uh, part of the property. Uh, there's a lot of problems that need to be fixed. The owner does not fix them and um, they end up calling code enforcement Code enforcement issues a, a citation that nobody can sleep in the accessory dwelling unit, which means now she doesn't have a place of her own. She's going to move into the house. She does not want to live with these two guys. The only reason this worked is because she has her separate space. They stop paying rent. Now, this is a kind of like novel um, case, right? It is one lease. Um, do we uh, you, generally, if you've got a bootleg unit, you uh, don't have to pay rent. I think we would have been entitled to a rent reduction for whatever the value of the accessory dwelling unit was. And we ended up in litigation for many, many months during which we ended up getting them free rent. I think the deal was worth about $40,000. Um, and even though it was a, you know, not the clearest case uh, where we would win, uh, but there was enough there that the landlord was willing to do that. Uh, about a year later, the same landlord called me and um, he's being evicted from uh, a, a place that I know, a place that has, that follows the rules, registers the units, doesn't have breaches of warranty of habitability, et cetera. And he wants me to represent him. And when I'm assessing the case for him, I tell him, First of all, this, this is a building I know. I, they pass their inspections. So you're not gonna have that defense. I see no defects in this notice. And um, so no, your expectations of walking away with a huge amount of money are too high. And that's when he reveals to me who he is. I had not recognized the name. Well, then how is it that on da 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 you were able to da 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 So I go and I look up the case. And then, well, because in that case I had ways to win. In your case, I don't have a way to win. I don't have the kind of leverage I need to get you what you want. Okay. So lots of stuff uh, in these two boxes that have to be considered. And we also need to consider the players. Who are the players? Who's our opponent? I had a case uh, this week. I'm training a lot of new lawyers. And one of my new lawyers had gotten himself on this move out path on a case where the tenant had said, oh no, actually the tenant was on the move out path. The tenant started on a move out path. That's probably why the, it was so easy for the landlord, for the, for the lawyer in the negotiation to go on this path. But I had put her on the pan stay path. What I told her, and this happens often with my clients, yeah, I get that you want to move, but you have no income right now. You don't have money for deposits. We're in the middle of a pandemic. You don't have any choice but to be on this path till you get a job, bring up your credit score, can find another place to go. So I had her on this road fighting to stay. Plus we could win her case. Why could we win her case? Her notice violates the emergency protections. She won't have a defense once the pandemic is over, if they serve a new notice, but we can win this case, have her here. So when I see this, uh, please review, move out offer. I'm like, huh, this is someone I've met with in office hours. Why are we on this path? Well, the what happens in court, so you're gonna end up going to, uh, if we go back to this notice of hearing, trial held in, 
within 20 days, there's going to be something called a mandatory settlement conference in all likelihood. And there is a bias amongst the judges that settlements mean when is the tenant moving. I have literally, I think we're doing a good job at educating judges, but every time a new judge comes on, I have literally had this conversation with a judge more than once. Uh, Ms. Pop, what is your client's uh, position on settlement? My client would like to pay their rent and stay or during the pandemic, my client would like the plaintiff to accept the uh, tenant rental assistance money from the state and stay. I have literally had judges say, Ms. Pop, that is not a good faith settlement position because their assumption is that the only good faith settlement positions are move out positions. So I have to give a speech about the value of home and that people have a right to defend their homes and that the judges should not just assume that everyone has to move out, that there are laws to protect people and keep them in place, that some of those laws existed pre COVID and that during COVID, we are putting a very high value on keeping people in place because you cannot shelter in place. You cannot comply with stay at home orders if you don't have a home to stay. And because every eviction is a potential threat to spreading the virus. A study came out in November, 2020, that nearly a half a million uh, COVID infections could be attributed to an eviction and nearly 10,000 of those were deaths. And so there is a real reason to keep people in place right now. So we've been very, very much focused on um, keep, keeping people in. Um, so this comes across my desk and I'm like, why are we on this move out road? Well, the lawyer has concerns about whether or not the case can be proven and those concerns are legitimate. But when I looked at all of the factors one of the factors is who is opposing counsel. That opposing counsel doesn't take cases to trial. He will always settle. We just have to keep our position on the table and he will eventually cave. And sure enough, we retracted the offer and the we're now on a, what are the terms for staying in the unit at least until the tenant finds a place to go. And actually what's gonna happen in that case is we're gonna continue and continue until after the pandemic and give her a chance um, to go ahead and go because she really does wanna go. Um, but there's a difference between what you want and what can happen, right? Um, before the pandemic, I had a client who was living in a substantially below market unit, relative, single mom, several kids, um, and her income could barely pay for this unit, let alone a unit on the market. But the landlord was being so horrible. And, you know, when landlords are being bad to you, a lot of it, a lot of the way that you can deal with the landlord is by being powerful. Okay. Landlords are like dogs and bees. If they know you are afraid of them, they become more, more rabid and they, they uh, go after you. I'm afraid of bees. If there is a bee anywhere in a picnic, they're after me. Why? Because they can sense that I'm afraid of them. But if you stand up to a landlord, that landlord is going to stop doing the harassment 90% of the time. If there's time, I, I know there's a few people here who are facing harassment. I will do that part of the presentation, which is on another slideshow. Um, so, uh, she really, so my client really wanted out. We had a good case and every week, uh, I mean, every appearance, we, we kept continuing the case, but I really wanna go. And I would tell her, find me, tell me where you're going and then I'll make that deal. Um, and one day she tells me, really, I just want you to make me this. Uh, I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. And my answer to her was, and I want to be 35 and 105 pounds, but we don't always get what we want. Now, eventually we did move her out, but we moved her out once she had a place to go. Similar story. Uh, I had a, a client who I represented several times uh, below market rate unit. Uh, he also was fed up with the harassment at around the third case. And I kept talking him out of taking larger and larger offers because I didn't think that the offers were good enough to keep him in new housing for the rest of his life. And he was close to retirement age. Um, one day I get a call from one of my lawyers saying, because uh, I have to approve all move outs that are 
more than $300 below market, so if the unit is more than $300 below market, I want to make sure that my lawyers are not making giving up below market rate units that we shouldn't give up. So, so the lawyer calls me, client doesn't want me to call you because he says you're going to talk him out of this. And I'm like, okay, and am I going to talk him out of this? And he goes, well, he says he has a plan and I like his plan. So they put him on. His plan was to retire in Thailand with the money that they were now offering and um, his uh, social security benefits. He had researched it, looked into it, had a friend already in Thailand who was going to put him up in a spare bedroom. That's a plan, right? I have a couple of clients who are moving to Merida, Mexico. I have a couple of clients. I have a client who's going to buy an RV um, and drive it to Seattle and live on a, her friend's land part of the year and then travel across the country to Florida, live on her friend's land for part of the year and then travel back and forth. Now, that's a nice retirement. That's a good plan. It's a pl So you know what I mean? So plans can be creative. They can involve buying a house in Riverside or um, Baker or in the areas outside of Los Angeles. They can include moving to Utah. I had a guy move to Arizona. Several of my clients have gone back to their home countries and then use the relocation money to, to buy their own homes. One of them bought a a uh, little restaurant with a house right on the beach and a place called, I think, Catamaco. Um, it, you know, those are all plans, but you have to have a plan. Another thing that I want to make sure that people realize is that when, is that the being in eviction proceedings can result in you walking away with some money. And we have a mortgage broker that works for a HUD sponsored nonprofit that is a whiz at helping non traditional home buyers get approved for loans. So if you're in that position, then um, please make sure you let us know that you wanna explore that. Uh, and I will tell you that when I bought my home, I was able to buy it because my mother was facing eviction. And when I first found out that they were gonna evict her for an owner occupied move-in out of her, I don't know, $500 a month Santa Monica uh, rent control department, um, <clears throat> I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, she's going to have to come live with me because there's no way she can replace this housing. But we turned that moment of adversity into a moment of opportunity by getting enough relocation money for her to put it down on a house. Okay. So uh, back to the players, I'm sitting there and this offer comes through. And the opposing counsel is not someone who would ever go to trial. Uh, you have to know the landlord. You have to know the judge. Um, when we know the judge, we also then learn our jury pool. Um, most Right now, the, the court system is a little up in the air. Um, so most of you will, wherever your case is filed, that's where the trial is going to happen. But if that court gets overloaded, or if you're in a court where we don't accept that judge, for instance, the commissioner in Pasadena, we don't do trials in front of him. He also doesn't do jury trials. So the cases get sent out to other judges. So we won't know your judge and where the trial is going to be until the last minute. And I have had situations where everything was voting in the direction of staying, but then we find out our judge we get to say no to one, we're stuck with the second one. I've had cases where we do a bad judge and then we do another bad judge. And so then we go meet with the judge and the judge gets rid of a lot of our defenses. We have to reassess um, our uh, bargaining position based on who the judge is um, and what community the case is going to be tried in. So if we stay downtown, we're gonna have a relatively neutral uh, judge because we know the judges downtown and most of them are relatively neutral uh, or and a diverse and meaning economically diverse, racially diverse, age diverse jury pool. If we get sent to Pomona, we're going to have a judge who is a good settlement judge including not assuming the tenant has to move. This is a judge that will really look at the situation and 
push the landlord to let the tenant stay if appropriate. Um, but we're going to have a conservative jury pool because Pomona jurors tend to be homeowners and then they tend to be a little bit more conservative than LA jurors. So we have to uh, take all of that into account, okay. including you. How risk adverse are you? How uh, strong are you going to be? How empowered are you by coming to these webinars and being educated? Um, you know, if you read my Yelp reviews, you'll find there's a wide variety. People either love me or hate me. And the people that love me are people that appreciate that I am no nonsense. I do not coddle my clients. You are, we are in battle here, people. We are in a war. We cannot be coddling people. People have to be strong. They have to stand up for themselves. They have to be informed. They have to be empowered. Otherwise, the other side will make mincemeat out of you. And so um, I, I, I tend to be sort of like a drill sergeant. And that is what you really need in this process. When I was a younger lawyer, very sweet, um, I would explain to my client the pros and cons of going forward uh, or not going forward. And my clients didn't always get the message, didn't always hear the danger points. When I tell you, you have a bad case, it's not because I'm being a Debbie Downer. It's because you have a bad case. I am probably the most reasonably zealous advocate in LA County, certainly, and probably the state. Um, I, when the law, when, when we're not coming in well in all of these factors, if I have a very vulnerable pop, uh, family, meaning large family, elderly, disabled, and a very below market rate uh, unit, and so there's a high risk of homelessness, I will fight to the bitter end for that family. However, there are limits to what we can do. And so I will tell you another story. I was in the downtown court once waiting for a case to be called. And this woman kept kind of looking at me and then sort of embarrassedly looking away. And I finally went up to her and said, hi, do I know you? And she goes, yeah, I met with you at your office. Oh, we're representing you. No, I decided to hire other agency. I'm like, huh, why did you decide to hire other agency? Well, you were such a Debbie Downer. And I said, really? And what did I tell you? You told me that my management company uh, never settles with a forgiveness of the rent, that in order to settle this case, I would have to agree to pay all the rent, that the best you were going to be able to do for me is a sealed record, um, and that you couldn't find any defenses in my case. Okay, what did the other agency tell you? That they would make them forgive the rent and give me time to move. Okay, I said, well, best to you. Um, and I didn't wanna like freak her out. I said, but I kind of stand by what I told you. Um, and so, but good luck. Two days later, she was back in my office. They had lost because the management company at issue doesn't forgive rent. If they have a dead bang losing case because we found a technical defense, they will dismiss that case and start all over before they forgive a penny of rent. And there were no defenses in this case. So you have to know when to, what is it? You have to know when to hold them, know when to fold them and know when to walk away. The other analogy I will use is Point Break, the scene where Keanu Reeves and Patrick Swayze jump out of the airport, uh, airplane to set up the, the scene. Keanu is an FBI agency agent that has infiltrated a gang of daredevil surfer bank robbers run by Patrick Swayze. Patrick has figured out Keanu is an FBI agent. He is escaping over the Sonora desert. He's going to jump out. His minions are waiting for him in a Jeep and Keanu sneaks onto the plane. Um, Keanu has a gun, no parachute. Patrick jumps out of the pain, plane. Keanu gets mad. He's getting away and then jumps out of the plane and then uh, catches Patrick in midair, where he initiates one of the most compelling negotiations ever. He, in order to pull the chute, has to drop the gun, in which case Patrick will escape. 
But Patrick is refusing to pull the chute. And if one of them doesn't pull the chute, they're both going to die. Drop the gun, pull the chute. It isn't going to happen. We're going to be, I think, highway pizza. And so they're yelling at each other. And at the last minute, Keanu drops the gun and pulls the chute. You have to ask yourselves who you are in that scene. And if you're Patrick, then, and you don't have a good case, then you're going to die and so is the landlord and there's going to be a mess. But if you have a good case, then you don't have to pull the chute. And you have to know how to do it, when to do it, at the last minute to get the best possible results, okay? So the players, and then we always go back to, can we win, right? I have uh, young lawyers call me all the time. I have such and such offer on the table. Uh, well, it could sound good on the, on the surface, right? It could sound like a good offer. They're offering $100,000, but we have to do this whole analysis before we decide whether it is, okay? So um, why don't we stop the recording right now for a second? Uh, Hello, everyone. During that little break, someone asked a, a good question <clears throat> that I think we should analyze using this, the, the, the chart. So in this case, the tenant has gotten a three-day notice to pay or quit for an exorbitant repair, exorbitant amount of money for a, a repair that is not the tenant's responsibility. This is a pattern and practice for this developer that I would put as a medium-sized developer. Um, and so the question is, what, how do we defend this case? Well, if this tenant were coming into my office and they already had an eviction case against them, what I would say is, what's the value of the unit? The unit is not protected by any rent stabilization ordinance. Uh, it is relatively low in value, but not protected. So they're going to be able to get this tenant out eventually. So that bodes in favor of settlement. Can we win? Probably because the repair shouldn't be the tenant's responsibility. So ultimately we probably can win this case. Problem, this tenant will, lives in Bakersfield where there are not enough lawyers and 99% of, law, of tenants lose their eviction cases. The default rate is around the 50% rate, meaning 50% of tenants can't even figure out how to get someone to help them write an answer. That number I think might be up like 68% during the pandemic based on the number of notices to vacate that we are getting for people who didn't file an answer because they thought there was a moratorium or they didn't understand what to do. So we think this number is, is higher. And if you file an answer, 99% of tenants that go to court alone lose. So unless we can get this tenant a lawyer, I doubt we can win. Other leverage, again, will there be someone to do discovery, jury demand, et cetera? Um, so we have a problem there. Tenant finances, probably collectible, uh, has a job. So that bodes in favor of not, of settlement, right? Uh, what are we risking? They haven't really, it's early. We don't have anything on the table. Uh, and who are the players? Well, we don't, aren't going to know opposing counsel. Um, in this case, because it's Bakersfield, we know the judges are going to be more conservative, not used to having lawyers representing tenants in court. There's a lot of uh, problems here, which makes it doubtful that we can win. Um, if she were already in eviction proceedings, then we would just do our best to mitigate the, all of these negative factors in this case. Uh, but because she's not in eviction proceedings and she can, she's still within the three-day period, the best choice for her might be to pay what's being demanded, stay out of eviction court, and then find some other way to resolve the problem. Now we came up with something. This uh, person came to office hours last night and we came up with something. And that is that this is a pattern of pra and practice. This is a middle-sized middle, middle -sized developer. And some of the tenants in one of his developments have already, tenants uh, might've been, he's, he does both rentals and home ownership. So that lawsuit might've been on behalf of homeowners filed a class action lawsuit over conditions issues. So there's a class action law firm that's already has experience with this landlord. If this is a pattern and practice, and also he has a pattern and practice of not returning security deposits, 
this might be a good class action suit to to get the tenant compensation uh, and uh, a remedy outside of eviction court. And you see how I looked at all of the, like, there's not a, an easy answer. Uh, we need to look at all of these factors, including is there going to be someone, is there going to be a player there to represent this tenant in, um, in a city where there isn't enough representation? Um, let's go on to this next um, section. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is quickly walk you through the types of notices. So evictions start with a notice. It's the paper that tells the tenant that the owner plans to file an eviction action. You've seen this diagram before. It gives the tenant X number of days to uh, do X or the eviction will be filed. There are lots of different notices. Um, this is a list of some of them with the minimum number of days they have to give you. They can always give you more three day pay or quit, 15 day pay or quit during the pandemic, 10 day pay or quit for tenants in public housing in Los Angeles, uh, notice to cure or quit, meaning stop violating your lease and, or leave. Usually it's three days to cure or quit. They can give you more. Notice to quit for nuisance. You've done something that can't be cured. Minimum three days, it can be more. Quit no cause. It's usually a 30 day notice or a 60 day notice. Uh, 30 if you've been there less than a year, 60 if you've been there a year or more. The quit no cause notice is only um, given to a tenant that doesn't have any rent stabilization protection. Uh, a no fault notice under rent stabilization. Each of these rent stabilization laws allow evictions for the owner to move in, a close relative, resident manager, to demolish, convert to condos, and other reasons. So do you have one of those notices? Uh, a notice to terminate a Section 8 voucher requires 90 days. An Ellis Act notice is given to someone who is in a rent stabilized unit, but the landlord is saying, I'm getting out of the rental housing market. I'm evicting all of the tenants. It's a minimum of 120 days. Disabled and elderly people can ask for a year extension. And um, and so uh, it's a sort of a special kind of a situation. And then leases are, can be self-terminating. So your lease could say at the end of the lease, the lease terminates and they don't have to give you a notice at all. Most management companies will give you a notice letting you know we are not going to extend your lease, um, but it's not required if the lease is self-terminating. So I mentioned rent stabilization laws. This is the state of California and this is the county of Los Angeles within the state of California. This is the county of Los Angeles. It used to be one jurisdiction, one government, one entity. But over the course of several decades, cities have formed, have incorporated into cities. The red is the city of Los Angeles. The gray is the other 87 cities that have their own um, governments. They are incorporated as separate governments. Now, Angelinos have a way of not knowing where they live. You need to know where you live. Um, during the pandemic, there was a guy on Facebook talking all about how he had put his landlord in his place because the he wasn't he couldn't be evicted because Mayor Garcetti was protecting tenants during the pandemic. The guy lives in Pomona. Mayor Garcetti has nothing to do with him. So you have to know where you live. And a lot of people live in these little tiny spaces that are surrounded by other cities, but are in fact unincorporated counties. So red is LA, gray is the other 87 incorporated cities, and white is unincorporated LA County. Pre-pandemic, there were rent stabilization laws in unincorporated county, Baldwin Park, Beverly Hills, Culver City, Inglewood, Los Angeles, Santa Monica, and West Hollywood. Glendale has an eviction protection law only, meaning there's protection against evictions, but all they have to do is raise the rent to market and then they can kick you out. 
um, for not paying the rent, right? Because you can't afford it. Uh, but it's some protection at least. So if the first thing that we need to do is determine that you don't have a rental subsidy, section eight, it's not public housing, it's not subsidized housing. Uh, and then we know that those federal laws are not what applies. We know we have to look at whether you're protected by one of these. And if you are in one of these cities, we look at the law and we look at your unit to see if the unit is protected. So for instance, in Los Angeles, it had it there. Every unit is protected, and then there's ten exceptions, exemptions, meaning ten characteristics that exempt a unit from the law. One of them is built after October of 1978. Another is a single-family home that's being used as a single-family home. If it's got multiple tenancies, being used as a boarding house, has been subdivided, there's an illegal garage then the game changes and then there is protection. But if it's being used as a single family home rented to one family, no protection. Uh, condominiums are exempt, except there are some exceptions to those exemptions. So we have to look at exactly where you're living. Always exempted, board and care facilities, hospitals, student housing, uh, cooperatives, subsidized housing, um, and a couple of other categories like that, okay? So we, now we've determined that you are protected by one of these laws. We look at that law to see what defenses it offers you. If we determine you're not protected by any of these laws, we have to look at the State Tenant Protection Act. The State Tenant Protection Act protects any unit that is at least 15 years old, but it does not protect single family homes or condominiums unless they are corporate owned. How did we get that? Most rent stabilization laws straight up don't protect condos and single family homes. Why? Because just like vacancy control is the holy grail for vacancy decontrol, no vacancy control, vacancy control, the ability to, to, to uh, be able to raise the rent to market is the holy grail for landlords. So vacancy to control is the holy grail. It's the most important thing to them to be able to raise the rent to market when a tenant moves out. Um, single family homes and condos, the ability to do that is the holy grail for like, it's the American dream. We protect that single family home. And so they're exempt from rent control. Um, the problem with that is that Wall Street during the 2008 mortgage crisis, bought up our single family home housing stock. And so there are a lot of single family homes owned by uh, Wall Street hedge funds and other investors. We don't wanna protect that, right? So uh, when the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment was fighting for this law, because they organized tenants in home in uh, properties that are owned by places like Blackstone and Invitation Homes, which are these Wall Street investors, they fought hard to get protection for their people. So if it is corporate owned, then it is protected. Uh, this law also does not protect duplexes if the owner lives in the second unit. And I don't know how that exception came in, right? It like, doesn't kind of make a lot of sense, but I would bet you that we were working a vote, trying to get someone to switch over. And they had the story of the little old lady and the devil incarnate tenant that made them their life miserable. And it was a duplex. And that's how that exception happened. These things happen based on like real life experiences and interests and issues that are happening in the negotiation in Sacramento. Uh, or if it's a local law uh, at the city council level. Um, and they, you know, when we go to school, they explain to us that a bill becomes a law by going through both houses of Congress and then the executive, in this case, the governor signs them. The truth is a lot of the negotiation happens outside of that process. Tenants have lobbyists in Sacramento. Uh, we, um, the tenant unions and organizations like ACE and a whole bunch of others are part of a coalition called Housing Now. And Housing Now proposes laws and supports laws and opposes laws. And so all of that negotiation that happens dictates whether or not 
so a unit will get protected. So in the case of the TPA, there are weaknesses in the TPA, including a landlord can evict you to do substantial renovation. That's like a loophole you can drive a truck through, but we didn't have enough power to get anything better than that. Landlord can, it does not, the tenant does not have protection until they've paid that 13 month. And so lots of landlords wanting to evict tenants um, who have one year leases so they can raise the rent to market. Uh, and the third loophole is the law allows increases of up to 10%. It's 5% plus the consumer price index. So right now increases of about six point something percent are allowed, um, but you know, which is a huge amount of money and 10% is even worse if the consumer price index goes up. Those are weaknesses in the law, could have done better. We need to close those loopholes. Um, but what it illustrates is the importance of getting involved. This is this sheet shows examples of notices. And this is it also illustrates why it is important for you to know what stage of the process you're in. The other day we got someone who insists they have a notice to vacate, a five-day notice to vacate. And they insist that there has not been any court process at all. And for whatever reason, we couldn't get a picture of the notice. So we put all the, all the forces in place to go into court and try to get the sheriff to stop because normally a five day notice to vacate comes from the sheriff. When the tenant finally gets us a picture of the notice they're talking about, it's one of these. It just says five day notice to vacate instead of um, five day notice to quit. And, and so we were never, we were not anywhere in the eviction process. So if you have a notice that looks like this, this is the beginning of the eviction process. It has to be in writing. A signature is not required. The person's name can just be typed. It does not require an official stamp. Uh, people often say it's not for reals. It was taken off the internet. Well, that's where they take them from. Uh, but it has to have certain language. And if it doesn't have that language, it is a defense. And our policy is that we do not advise landlords about their errors and their notices. Unless we can get rid of all desire to evict the tenant by negotiating something early in the notice stage, we let landlords make their mistakes. We raise those mistakes as defenses in the answer. We litigate wholeheartedly because once the landlord is well invested in the case, we're more likely to get a permanent solution for the tenant, such as a withdrawal of the notice permanently or a long-term lease or something that protects the tenant. The notice has to be served in person, meaning delivered and handed to you. If you are not home, they can leave it with an occupant and send one in the mail. Regular mail is all that's required. If no one is home, they can post it on the door and mail it regular mail. The law also says they're supposed to try to serve you at your place of business, but there's a lot of cases that say otherwise. So it's not really a requirement. Land attendants always complain of landlord harassment at the point at which they start getting notices. And yes, they are sending you notices often because they want you to get fed up and move. And yes, I have had the, I had a case once where my client got a, the landlord said, I need you to move because my daughter's moving in. I'll give you a couple of free months rent. She goes and she figures out she's entitled to like $19,000. The equivalent now is 21,900 $21, because she's disabled at the time she was entitled to about you know, 17 or 18 or $19,000. She tells the landlord, okay, I'm required, I'm entitled to a 60 day notice and um, $19,000 if you wanna evict me so your daughter can move in here. Landlord doesn't wanna pay her that. Landlord doesn't wanna go through the whole rigmarole. Landlord starts harassing her. How does he harass? First, he serves her, he keeps claiming that she's not paying her rent files five eviction actions against her and dismisses all of them on the day that she, uh, on the first court date. He takes away use of the yard. He takes away use of parking. So he starts reducing amenities. He takes away washer and dryer. Um, and so he's doing all kinds of things like that. 
if a tenant experienced each notice that the tenant got as harassment, and it really is, but it's also behavior that is protected by the litigation privilege. We have a right to go to court. So this is, I didn't file this case. This case came to me uh, at a clinic. I wouldn't have filed the case because I think that the tenant, that all of the, the each action that the landlord took, the law permitted them to take, even though it was harassment. Uh, we now have stronger anti-harassment laws that didn't exist at the time. But the trial is like in a month or so and her, her lawyer has dumped her, but he's put together all of the paperwork. So I'm like, hey, I'm a good litigator. I'll litigate this case. So I litigate it and we get a judgment for $89,000 for her. She'd already moved out. She had moved out because of the pressure and we get her an $89,000 judgment. Um, the landlord files a motion for judgment notwithstanding the verdict and we lose and the judge takes the verdict away from us and gives the, the it tells, says basically the landlord does not have to pay her the $89,000. In the, the day of the argument of the motion, I had pointed this out in my papers, but also stressed it. And I tell the judge, I'm sorry, Your Honor, but during all of the motions in limine, meaning the pre-trial motions before the jury was called in, they made these very same arguments about the litigation privilege and you ruled in my favor. And the judge honestly said to me, Miss Pop, I never thought you would win. And I knew that if I took these, uh, the case away from you at the pre-trial stage, you would appeal but I'm not going to compound my mistake by not granting this motion. The tenant got mad at me, hired a lawyer who filed an appeal and then um, dropped the appeal because in the end, these were all actions that were protected by the litigation privilege. Now we now have tenant harassment ordinances in place that give tenants a little bit more teeth um, in these situations, but some are, so we have them now in LA City and LA County, but there's been an anti-harassment ordinance in place in the city of Santa Monica for years. And there's a case that basically says, yeah, but if these are legal notices, the landlord has a right to serve them. And so this area of um, harassment is very, very difficult area of law. Um, so tenants complain about harassment. They say, they sent me so many of them. Well, it's one to you, one to every other adult and one to all unnamed occupants. So minimally, there's gonna be two copies of the notice. And if you weren't home, they're either leaving and posting one and mailing one. So now we got four minimum of the notice. It's not harassment, it is making sure that you got it. They posted it on the door and it was open and now everybody knows my business. Well, that's what the law requires to make sure you see it. They brought it to my pace of business. Honestly, that's what they're supposed to do. Um, so, but you're right. If they bother doing it, it's because they wanna embarrass you, but it's what the law requires. So now I'm gonna show you samples. This is the three day pay or quit. For all of these notices, all the adults are listed here, plus anybody else who might be in possession. This might say all unnamed occupants. And then it says, you are illegally holding on to this property because you owe this amount of money for these months. If this amount is overstated, then it's a defense to the eviction. If they get the months wrong, pre-COVID, not a defense. They can screw up on the months. But in the COVID protections, if they get the months wrong, that is a defense if it's COVID-related rent. And then you have three days to pay the rent or move out, or we're gonna file an eviction action and declare a forfeiture of your lease or rental agreement. Any of this language missing and it's a defense. Um, and then they have to say the date, print the name of the agent, the human being that, they, that you have to pay, the address, the phone number and the hours of operation. This is one that is missing, I believe, the where you're supposed to pay, et cetera. 
This one doesn't have the forfeiture language. So at the end of this lawsuit, you could just pay your rent because it doesn't have the forfeiture language. This is our declaration during COVID. We are asking people, um, and this is more the subject of the one o'clock webinar, but if you have not paid for any of the months uh, past, then you should be filling this out and sending it to your landlord. And you can do it prospectively. The law that allows for this is over. It ended October 1st, but you should be notifying your landlord that you have COVID related um, impacts and will not be paying the rent. And some of the local laws require written notice. This declaration will comply with the local laws while it will not help you with state protections because they ended October 1st. If you do it for October forward, it also isn't gonna hurt you to do it. So just do it. When you get one of these notices, we expect you to come to a webinar. A lot of people get frustrated. They want a lawyer. They want a lawyer assigned to them. They want a lawyer that they know they're going to be able to count on. They want a lawyer to call their landlord. They want a lawyer to make the notice away, go away. <clears throat> it isn't going to happen. There's over a half a million people in this position. A lot of you are getting these notices. You can come to these webinars. You can learn your rights. Um, and for a three-day pay, pay or quit, mainly your rights are watch out for any information that the lawsuit has been filed in court, the court will send you a courtesy notice. Do not avoid service. If somebody knocks on the door, answer the door, accept service and immediately get help. And I will show you where you can get help. But if you want to talk about your notice, first of all, I'm telling you everything about a three-day notice right now. If you have a three-day notice to pay rent or quit and you have the rent, pay it to avoid eviction. If you don't have the rent, well, then you don't have the rent. And so the eviction action will be filed. And I'm going to tell you in a minute where you can get representation in that eviction case. Okay. And you also know now that there are protections. If you have bad conditions, start documenting it. If you haven't already, take pictures and video of the bad conditions. Um, and so that, so webinars and uh, we do have one-on-one -on -one consultations at the webinars. And if we don't get to you at a webinar, you can come to my office hours, which are Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 6 p.m. Please try to come on Mondays and Wednesdays. Fridays, I only do it for an hour. And mainly what I do is identify emergencies and send people here. Um, Mondays and Wednesdays, I'll stay on until we're done, no matter how many people come on, okay? Um, at the one o'clock presentation, we explain this complete um, uh, chart about what to do if you haven't paid the rent for March through August, September through November, through September. Um, for these months, you have to send that declaration. And if you do, the landlord can never evict you. For these months, you have to send the declaration and pay 25% but you had to have paid that by September 20th. And if you did, the landlord can never evict you. If you didn't do these steps already and the landlord serves you a three-day notice to pay or quit, then we will defend the case. For the months starting in October, they can serve a three-day pay or quit, right? But the message you should be getting here is when you get a notice, that is a pay or quit notice to avoid eviction pay. If you absolutely can't, then be very attentive to any letters from the court warning you that you've been sued, uh, accept service, don't avoid the knock on the door, and I will tell you where to get representation in a minute. And again, at one o'clock, we explain that if you are haven't paid the, um, the rent, you should apply at housingiski.com for rental assistance. We also will look at whether there are local protections that protect you, okay? So um, if you, so the city of LA has a pretty strong law. Uh, what it says is that your rent, if it's COVID related reason for not having paid, 
is not due until 12 months after the landlord, after the governor, um, the mayor uh, and the city council and the, um, issue an end to the state of emergency. That hasn't happened yet. To our, in, LA, in LA City, we're still in a state of emergency. So if your landlord serves you a three-day notice to pay rent or quit for October rent and then files an eviction action, then two things are going to happen. First, under what remains of the state laws, the state protections, the landlord has to tell the court under penalty of perjury, I am cooperating with the rental assistance process. And if they don't, they won't get that summons, so they can't move the case forward. So that's number one. And if there's no summons, you shouldn't answer because without a summons, the court doesn't have jurisdiction. So you don't have to answer. I have someone on the call on the webinar who swears there's no summons in their packet, but somehow they got a default judgment. The landlord got a default judgment against them and they have a sheriff's notice to vacate. Well, I wanna go through every page of that packet because if a summons was never issued, then the sheriff cannot kick them out. They don't have any power, okay? So if you live in the city of Los Angeles again and you get a three-day notice to pay rent or quit and the landlord files an eviction action, they cannot get a summons unless they're cooperating with rental assistance. If you get approved for that rental assistance and you have a notice of approval, then the eviction process comes to a screeching halt even if they were able to get a summons, okay? And on top of that, we're gonna raise as a defense, this rent wasn't even due yet because it's not due for 12 months after the local government declares an end to the state of emergency, okay? So that's an example. And where are we going to make these arguments? We're going to make them in court. And how are you going to get a lawyer to um, represent you in court? You're going to be a good tenant. You're going to come to the webinars. You are going to become educated. You are going to follow my instructions when I tell you how to apply for services. Okay. Um, if you, let's say you live in one of these gray areas and let's use Pasadena, because I know that law fairly well. In Pasadena, same kinds of defenses. Tenants in Pasadena don't have to start paying their COVID related rent until six months after the local government uh, declares an end to the state of emergency. If you live in any of these other cities, you can go on stayhousedla.org and you can click on uh, the Know Your Rights button to get a chart where all of the cities are listed. We teach you how to do this at the one o'clock where all the cities are listed and, um, and what the protections are that are listed. If you live in the white areas, the unincorporated areas of the county or any city that has a weaker law, then the county protections protect you. Now, unfortunately, there is something called state preemption. The state protections came into effect, were passed in September of 2020 and started in October of 2020. What that law says is that if a local government already had a law in place, like LA did, then that law is still in place with regards to anything in that law whether it's protection against non-payment of rent evictions or protection against other kinds of evictions. But the state law also says, if a law was not already in place, then you can't enact one now if it has to do with non-payment of rent evictions. The County Board of Supervisors, unfortunately, were they passed protections for a month, extended them for a month, extended them for a month, extended them for two months, and then they started doing two or three month extensions. But in September, they didn't, the law that exists now was not in place in September of 2020 when the state laws went into effect. And therefore they were invalidated by this concept of preemption uh, if it has to do with non-payment of rent. Other protections are still in place, and I'll explain what those other protections are in a minute or more detail at the one o'clock webinar. Um, so 
the basic message here is we need to look at your situation to see what applies. But what you should be thinking to yourself is, where do I live? Do I live in an area that has rent control? Yes, no. Is my unit protected? Yes, no. Uh, do I live in an area that has its own local COVID law? Yes, no. Uh, if no, am I protected by the county law? Yes, no, okay? So uh, again, these are the rent stabilization laws. And now I'm moving to cure or quit notices. This is a typical one. Again, all the adults listed, any others in possession. This is the address. This is the paragraph of the lease you're violating. This is how you're violating it and how you can stop violating it. Witnesses, dates and times. And if you don't stop violating your lease, uh, we are going to um, file an eviction action and declare a forfeiture of your lease. Now, ideally, I would say that a tenant should be able to have a lawyer who is their lawyer and who's going to be their lawyer forever the moment they have a problem with a landlord. But we don't live in a world that has that number of lawyers. I think there's probably now about 65, 70 lawyers in the entire system in LA County representing tenants in eviction. And it's the most we've ever had. And it's thanks to funding from the county, city of LA, county of Los Angeles, city of Los Angeles, Santa Monica and Long Beach that we have the ability to provide representation for free to more tenants than we've ever had. But it isn't enough lawyers and it isn't enough money um, to represent everyone at all stages of the litigation. And so again, a lot of this we're doing through these webinars. And if you stick with the webinars and follow instructions, you should be fine. However, the, in my view, these cure or quit notices are delicate enough that we really should have lawyers for these. We should be negotiating these to avoid evictions, but again, we're not gonna do it in most cases. We're gonna ask you to come to a webinar and where we'll explain your rights and tell you how to get legal help. The quit for nuisance, this is what it looks like. It could look a little bit formatted a little bit different, but basically it'll say what you're doing wrong. And again, you come to a webinar and we explain the laws, uh, possible defenses and uh, where you can get legal help. Um, there's a tendency for lay advocates to want to defend the tenant and send a letter to the landlord and even for, for uh, tenants themselves. I always shudder when my clients say I sent a letter to the landlord. Usually that letter will include a confession. I am really sorry that I was walking around not wearing a mask for weeks and weeks in spite of the fact you asked me to wear an, a mask. I promise I won't do it anymore. We don't really want to make confessions uh, in, in letters. It is probably better to just stay silent and you probably should not be writing letters unless you have a lawyer and that lawyer needs to have made a commitment to represent you in the eviction lawsuit before they go around writing letters. Um, I have defended cases where it was a letter from an inexperienced lawyer, from a lay advocate or the client that was the smoking gun against us. Um, and so please be cautious. Quit no cause. Again, this is you are in a non-rent controlled unit. Uh, it's 30 days if you've been there less than a year, 60 days a year or more. These are prohibited during the pandemic anywhere in LA County. Uh, because the county law, the part of it that has still survived, requires that there be a uh, cause in, stated in the notice. Um, Section 8 termination, that requires 90 days. And then the LS Act that I talked about earlier. This is a typical 30-day notice to quit. It has this extra, or it has to have this extra language about the return of your property. Often they forget to put that language in. This is the same thing except the 60 day notice. This one doesn't have that required language. And so it is a defense to the eviction. When my client gets one of these, a lot of my allies, a lot of other lawyers will call and say, 
hey, there's a defect in this notice. What's the landlord gonna do? They're gonna correct the defect, withdraw the notice, correct it, serve a new one, and now you're not gonna have the defense, right? So we don't do that. We just let them file their lawsuit based on the defective notice. And then we um, litigate that. Um, I think there are clients on the, on the call right now who I met with this week who there are defects in their notices. They wanted me to go in and do a motion for summary judgment and they had all these ideas about how to do that. What do I accomplish if I do that? We get a victory sooner. Do we need a victory sooner? No, we need for the landlord to really feel the pain of what it is to evict a tenant. Um, and we need to negotiate that they're gonna withdraw the notice and not serve a new one and let you stay as a tenant. And if you don't have protection past the pandemic, we need maybe a year or two lease. We need to negotiate, use the error to negotiate what works for you. So we don't just you know, go running in to win quickly because winning quickly doesn't always benefit the tenant. We have a case coming up that um, the landlord is in pro per, his notices are 100% defective. We are going to win. Um, we haven't, we could have made a motion for judgment on the pleadings all along. Why haven't we? Well, the eviction action protects our client to some extent, because as long as we're in the eviction action, the police behave differently when uh, there's a dispute and the landlord's trying to kick out the tenant by force. The landlord, it's easier to keep a landlord in check if we're already in court. There's all kinds of reasons why we, we prefer to have the case in eviction proceedings um, rather than not. Um, but we're getting to the point where the case is very ripe and we're probably going to get sent out. And when we are sent out, we are likely to either in our court where the case is now, or as soon as we get to the new judge, make a motion for judgment on the pleadings rather than spend five days picking a jury, et cetera, et cetera. Because for the extra five days, it isn't worth it, right? Uh, we're just gonna, at that point, uh, use the leverage that we have to try to get our client, which we have been doing all along, the deal that she needs, um, or go ahead and win and use the victory to get her the deal that she needs, or then represent her in another case. Uh, this one also defective. It doesn't have much in it at all, um, including the required language about the property. When you get one of these, again, we're asking people to come to the webinars. Um, and I know it doesn't feel like you're getting enough support. And I know it's awkward, especially, like I have people who come to the webinars and to office hours all the time. And I know it must be disturbing that I don't remember who you are or the facts of your case. I have to go and look up what you've told us before. But to be honest, I was starting to think I was developing Alzheimer's when I have now gone to the neurologist and been tested. And what my doctor is telling me is information overload. I am helping roughly 30 to 40, like I touch 30 to 40 cases a day. It is a lot to hold in your head. And so that's the reason why we keep very careful records and write everything down. Um, so don't feel discouraged by the fact that you have to tell me each time, remind me who you are. Um, you're getting good, solid advice, even though it doesn't feel as personal as you would want it to feel. And so it's a little bit hard to, to get the confidence and build rapport when there are so many of you. But I can tell you that unless you can afford to pay a lawyer, uh, a private lawyer, then you are uh, getting the best, best possible uh, help at the notice stage that you can get. And quite honestly, I think this help, if you still stick with it, is probably even better than what most private attorneys can give you unless you're paying them hourly. Uh, we do have a referral list of private attorneys that we trust. Uh, we don't guarantee their work, but there are people who are in it for the right reason. If you prefer to go to a private attorney, I can put that list of private attorneys in the chat so that you can, and Kevin, if you have it, if you can put it in the chat, that would be great. 
Um, so um, if you feel that you'd rather have that. I will tell you though, that during the pandemic, I have had the displeasure of having to contend with people who couldn't stick it out at the clinics, um, decided to go with a private attorney. Now, all of the complaints I've had have not been people on our list, but decided to go with another private attorney and then ended up with a bad result when and while they and when I look at the case, we could have done much better. But you have to be willing to work within our system. Uh, so during the po pandemic, no cause evictions are prohibited. They were prohibited by the state laws, which these are the numbers of the three, three state laws. This I think passed in September. I forget when this one passed. And this one is the most recent one. So these laws protected you from no cause evictions until September 30th. The LA County law protects until January 30th. But if you're in a city like Pasadena uh, or LA city and many others, um, then there is in the, like, there's no end to these protections in either the Pasadena or LA law. Um, Section 8 termination. This is actually one of the rare cases that where we will actually uh, represent someone in a negotiation. Why? If Because if you're in a Section 8 unit and, I'm sorry, if you're in a unit with a Section 8 subsidy and you have rent stabilization protection, there are cases that we can cite to the landlord that will... Um, that will make the notice go away forever because they really cannot evict you. Um, they can terminate the subsidy, but they cannot raise the rent beyond what you pay. And so there's a way to get rid of it permanently. And so we set you up with a lawyer. Uh, right now we're doing most of our consultations over the internet. If you have a digital divide issue, then we would have you come in masked and gloved. The Ellis Act eviction is also an eviction where we will open up the case at the notice stage. Why? Because, so we'll set you up with a lawyer. Why? Because often the landlord is bluffing. Owners buy, and there are, there's at least one building that's supposed to be here. So this is a good time for you to listen carefully. Often the landlord is bluffing. They come in, they buy the building, they start giving you move out offers, offering you a little bit of money or a little bit of free rent to move out. And when you don't accept that voluntary move out offer, they'll say, well, then we're gonna Ellis the building, meaning we're gonna take it off the rental housing market. It is expensive to Ellis a building. Most of the time they're bluffing. So we can call their bluff if all the tenants organize and get them to stop harassing and stop pushing people out. We also wanna make sure that um, every tenant exercises their one year extension if they uh, are elderly or disabled. Uh, we also wanna make a plan for discouraging the landlord from doing this. We also wanna make sure that if you're gonna move, you get the maximum amount of time and money we also want to make sure that we look at any opportunities to purchase either this building or to get you enough time and money to be able to purchase someplace else. And again, we will make sure you are connected to legal assistance. So that's the 120 day Ellis notice. Ellis notices also we organize the building we um, provide the assistance to get the extensions and we also provide, we connect you with either ACE or a tenants union so that you can um, uh, fight to save the building. So it really looks more like this. We've got the lawyer, but we're really working with organizers to organize the building and sometimes even the surrounding community to discourage the landlord from ellising the building. 
Um, as I stated earlier, the Eviction Defense Network is part of the Right to Counsel Coalition. We were formed, I believe, in 2018 to um, fight for a statutory right to counsel, that is a right to a lawyer uh, if you are having problems with your landlord. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had developed a pilot program to provide full scope representation to tenants starting at the notice stage to every tenant in three zip codes. It was gonna be a pilot. Um, the pandemic hits and the funding source, which was the county and city of Los Angeles, basically told us uh, too many people in need. You need to widen this out and you need to represent anyone with the same amount of money, everyone in the county. So we started this Stay Housed LA website where you can find out more about your rights, find other workshops, and I encourage you to go to other workshops. Uh, Kevin will again put the three that are sponsored by Eden, I'm sorry, the four that are sponsored by Eden on the chat. Go to those, but also go to any of the ones that are on this website. Why? The more information you can get, the better. If you go to a workshop that is being done by somebody else and they, you hear something different in that workshop from what I have told you, please do not argue with the presenter. Take good notes and come back here and tell me what you're being told that is different or that you think is different. I will then vet it, check it out, contact the presenter myself because this coalition is supposed to be saying the same thing to everyone. So if there are two presenters that have two different ideas about the law, we need to figure out whether it's a legitimate difference of opinion or whether someone is not quite getting it. And these laws are very, very, very complicated and they keep changing. And so we have to constantly do this quality control check, but do go to other webinars. Um, and then here you can also get legal help. If you click the get legal help button, you will be asked to fill out a questionnaire. That questionnaire will eventually, when you submit it, result in you getting a message that says which two organizations have been assigned to help you. One will be a legal services program or LSP. There are 11 legal services programs in the network, including the Eviction Defense Network. And the other one will be a community-based organization that does tenant rights organizing or a CBO. And together, the two are supposed to work with you to figure out what we need to do here to save your housing or to meet your goals. If the LSP does not contact you within 48 hours, you're given a number of where you should go. If you make this request and, the, and you are not in eviction proceedings yet, it is my understanding that most LSPs are referring you, certainly we are, we're gonna refer you to this webinar or to the Tuesday, Thursday or Saturday webinars or to all of them. Why? Because it is, we're getting way too many requests and it is easier to tell 30 people at once the law and then do a little bit of individual counseling if necessary. That is a more efficient way to do this, okay? Um, but these webinars are really great if you work with them. So if you text me and say, do I need to go to the webinar? I can't answer that. I would say you need to go to the webinar until you can teach it. If you can teach it, then you can come once a month or whenever you notice that there's a change in the law. But until you can teach it, yes, you need to come to the webinars, okay? Um, this is um, how to get help from the Eviction Defense Network. If your case is um, scheduled to be filed or in the jurisdiction of the downtown LA court, also known as the Moss Court, Pasadena or West Covina or Compton courts. For Compton, you, you have to be in the Compton court but live in the city of Los Angeles. You can go to edn.la at the lower right corner of that website. There is something called an eviction prevention form. You fill it out and you wait for a response. Fill it out only once, please. Every time you fill it out, if it's a duplicate, we have to go through this whole process to close it out so we don't double count cases. So please fill it out only once, wait for a response. 
if you do not get a response within 48 hours, you can come to my office hours, which are on Zoom, Monday, Wednesday, or Friday at 6 p.m. Again, on Fridays, I only take an hour, so I identify emergencies and send people to the Saturday webinars. It's better to come on Mondays and Wednesdays where I'm willing to stay until the last person is seen. Um, and uh, there's no presentation at office hours. So you'll get the, the meeting is waiting to start until I let you in. And I will periodic, every time I let someone in, I'll say, I've just let in Mike next R and then I'll list out who is left. Uh, still in the queue. So you know approximately how long it will be before um, I call you. Please stay attentive to your, um, to your uh, screen. Uh, the other day, a, a couple of times someone has tried to come on, but it's clear that they're walking away from their computer because every time I let them in, they are not there. And then eventually I give up and then they don't get seen. So you have to be, you know, you, you can have the TV on, but be listening to for, for when I call for your name. And when I call for your name, please immediately connect to the audio. Uh, we're spending about a two or three minutes per person. Please connect to audio, texting them, please connect to audio. And then when you connect to audio, you need to unmute. So you have to connect to audio and unmute. Um, so if we don't get back to you, you come to this. And then I just look it up talk to you, interview, and send you a confirming email, okay? Um, and any other courts other than these, you go to Stay Housed LA for help. Um, if you are assigned to an LSP and you're having some issues getting through, you can come back to office hours and I will try to enter, actually I heard, the, I, I hate the word try. We should do or do not, I'm a big believer in Yoda. Do or do not, there is no try. So if you're having a problem with your LSP, I will send them an email to try to smooth it over if you come to offer sellers. Um, if you um, know someone with digital divide issues, help them resolve their digital divide issues. Help them get a cell phone that you can get a, a smartphone at safelink.com, they're government funded. Um, everybody should have a smartphone. We live in a world where not having a smartphone is like not having a phone at all. So much happens on the internet. We need to help people close the digital divide issues. But if for whatever reason you can't, that is the digital divide number, 888-694-0040. Again, these are all County of Los Angeles services. If someone is facing an immediate emergency lockout, they can dial 213 340-4714, that's 24 hour number for immediate emergency lockouts. The other day at 2.30 in the morning, someone from one of these webinars called that number. I picked it up and they had a question about a three day notice to pay rent or quit. I am a very nice person, except when I'm not. And the reason he was calling at three in the morning is because he had tried calling me twice during the day, the day before and I wasn't available and he just figured I'd be available at 2.30 in the morning. Not okay. It wakes me up, it wakes up my spouse, it is unfair. And so, and I'm not gonna help you at 2.30 in the morning just because you decided that's the time you're gonna call me. So please, this is for immediate emergency lockouts, the landlord's violating the law, they're there, you need to call. I used to, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were not calling the police for a lot of reasons. First, it was the height of the Black Lives Matters protests and the police were showing up to support the landlords in riot gear. So we were staying away from the police. Frankly, I still believe that the police tend to take the landlord's side, although we've made some strides in fixing that during the pandemic, mainly through putting media attention on the problem. Um, but at the beginning of the pandemic, we had plenty of volunteers that if somebody needed to be defended from an illegal lockout early in the morning, I could put out an alert on this thing called rapid response and 20 people would show up and either put the person back in possession if the tenant could prove they were a tenant or call the police and or wait for the police to come if the landlord calls the police 
and intervene. And we were having a huge success rate at keeping people in. But the volunteers have gone back to work or are burnt out or spent too many nights doing it. It's very hard to get people to, to do this now. And so um, we are, I am now advising people to call the police and then I try to intervene on the phone with the officers if they will talk to me. These are the uh, webinars and office hours that Kevin has been posting in the chat. There is no uh, password to get in, but every once in a while people say that it's asking for a password. Um, if it asks you for a password, um, you can text me and I will send you the password, but don't be late to the webinar, okay? Get in 10 minutes before so that we can get you in by the, we, you notice we waited for 10 minutes. So that's like a 20 minute window to deal with any technical issues. Once I start the, the webinar, I don't, except I did do that today because the, the phone kept going off. Um, I, I'm not going to stop to let you in because it disrupts the webinar. So be on time, be here five to 10 minutes early so we can deal with any technical issues. Um, I am now going to show you what the other papers look like. So this is the summons. The summons is the paper that is, should be at the very top of the packet that gets delivered and it should be handed to you in person. But Sometimes it isn't. I have a lot of people who swear that other papers are on top. And sometimes they come in with the packet already stapled. And yeah, other stuff is on top. Why? Because some of the lawyers for the landlords are bottom feeders that want to trick you. This is the paper that has your instructions that you have to go to the court and that you have five calendar days and that a letter or a call is not enough, that it tells you how to get a hold of a self-help center. The self-help centers are part of the Right to Counsel Coalition, so they will either do your answer or refer you to one of the 11 LSPs. So if this isn't on top and you're getting 35 pages and you're trying to go through it and you don't catch this because it's in the middle or not there at all, um, you know, that can be a problem. But the solution to that is you now know if you get a court paper, you have five days to answer, five calendar days, and we should not wait till the last minute. We had a horrible thing happen at our office uh, with a woman who's, there have been six eviction attempts. So she kind of should have known better, okay? Um, but when she got the courtesy notice from the court, she waited too long to go get a copy of the summons and complaint. And then when she came to our office, she didn't have a complete copy and so we couldn't do the answer. So then we had her go back to the court to get the copy again. And by, she finally arrived with everything we needed on the 25th of August, I think. And we filed an answer the very next day. Unfortunately, the landlord lied, said she'd been personally served and already had a default judgment from way before she first contacted us. <clears throat> then there was an error in the court's website and the court's website didn't show that a default judgment had already been uh, requested. We filed an answer, we propounded discovery, we did all kinds of stuff. And then suddenly there's a notice to vacate in her mailbox. Now, a notice to vacate like a summons and complaint is supposed to be handed to you. The, but if the sheriff arrives and if you're not there, they'll post it on the door and mail it to you. So she wasn't home. The sheriff probably posted it on the door, but I would bet anything the landlord stole it because she came in with a version that came in the mail and it had already expired because it takes about five days for um, the, for, you know, the sheriff to get it in the mail. It's, uh, you know, the big county system, post office by the time we got, that she got it, she called us the day after it had expired. We have to give notice 10 a.m. the day before we're going. So we couldn't get in for another day. And we did the very first possible notice that could be given, we gave. But while we were, we, we could only get into court at 1.30 and the sheriff locked her out in the morning. 
okay? So this is an example of how you have to really, really take very seriously any indication that you already are in eviction proceedings and file as quickly as possible um, because otherwise the landlord could lie and you could end up in uh, in eviction proceedings. This is the notice, the courtesy notice that I've been referring to from the court. This is what it looks like. One is sent to each tenant and then one goes to, e to each adult that is sued and one to all unnamed occupants. It has, these are all members of the Right to Counsel Coalition. Um, so you can either go to stay house delay. I wouldn't try these numbers because frankly, they ring very, very, like it takes a long time to get through. Uh, just either go to edn.la if you're in one of our courts or go to stay house delay to get assigned. It happens much faster that way. This is something called a prejudgment claim. This could be what's on top. All of these court papers tell you um, that something is up. This is the complaint. This is the answer. This is your side of the story. We help you figure it out. So it's not a letter. It's not a phone call. It's this court form. This is a request for entry of default. So the I think there's someone on the line who call, who was at yesterday's office hours very concerned because they've already filed an answer and they have a request for entry of default. How could this happen? I already filed an answer. You help me find the answer. Why am I getting a request right now? Right? Really, really hyper. Well, um, what read what it says. And I would wager that it says enter the default of all unnamed occupants and not of any of the people that have already filed answers. So if you get one of these and your name is here, then we need to really make sure your answer has been accepted and there's no problems. But if it says all unnamed occupants, well, you've already answered, you are protected, okay? Um, after the answer is filed, there's all these steps that I described earlier. And all each of these uh, gives us an opportunity to negotiate primarily for people who wanna move out and have a plan and a place to go. Uh, but it also can give us an opportunity to make it clear to the other side that you're not giving up on this, that you are staying. There's also all kinds of motions that can be done. A motion is a written pleading that tells the judge, hey, let's do something different in this case. You have to have points and authorities, meaning of the law to back you up. Uh, the most common one is the motion for summary judgment. That's either side saying, hey, we all agree what happened here. What happened here is X, Y, Z. What we disagree on is what that means under the law. And so then you go in and the court decides one or the other side is going to win. We very rarely do motions for summary judgment for the reasons that I said before. All it does is speed up the resolution of the case. We'd rather resolve the case permanently than win on a technicality and have them start again. Um, but, um, but the other side has been doing a lot more motions for summary judgments and sometimes they catch us off guard, right? Because it takes the case away from a jury if the judge agrees. I talked about discovery, that is, asking all the questions and asking for all the evidence. And then we have to prepare, prepare jury trial documents. This gets done primarily without you. In our office, very early on in the litigation, as soon as you, we call it um, the evidence meeting, you will have a meeting with a lawyer where you are asked to bring in the evidence and all your witnesses. You have to pretend like the trial is the next day, okay? People will often dilly-dally and send us a little bit here and a little bit there. And then the morning of trial, oh yeah, I just found this video that shows that bloody bloody. You know, we need all that stuff early in the game because we want to prepare a witness list and exhibit list early in the game and be prepared early in the game. So pretend that your trial is the day after your evidence meeting scour your phone, your email, your uh, apartment for all of the notices and all of the things that you've spread out all over the place throughout the years. All of you should be buying a three ring binder with pocket dividers so that you can keep your lease in one pocket, 
all the notices that you ever get from your landlord in correct chronological in another pocket, all of your rent receipts in another pocket, all of your complaints to the landlord about bad conditions, pictures, et cetera. You need to be very well documented. Um, you participate in preparing the witnesses on the exhibit list. The rest of it we do on our own. Um, the jury instructions, remember your case will be heard by a group of people that are not lawyers and are not judges and they don't know the law. And so jury instructions teach the jury the law. Those have to be negotiated with the other side and the judge. Motions in limine, let's say we don't want the jury to know that in five years ago you were convicted of fraud, right? Because that is a crime that is about the ability to tell the truth. So we don't want them to know that you committed fraud someplace else. We might do a motion in limine to exclude that. And then the verdict form. Uh, Post-judgment motions, again, if you lose either because you didn't answer or because you um, went to trial and lost, you're gonna get a notice to vacate. Uh, it looks like this. This is the last day that you can be there. It is not the date of your lockout. The next day is the first day that the sheriff could be there. It attached to it is this form, it's three pages. Um, if, it, if this is not marked, so if at 25 they mark two, then, uh, and there are other adults in your household, those adults can fill out the claim of right to possession and the case starts all over for them if they can prove that they were occupants um, when the, before the lawsuit was filed. Um, this is the pre-judgment claim of right to possession. It should be attached to that packet that gets served at the door. If you're not listed here and you want to defend the case, to bring yourselves into the litigation, you have to fill this in and say, me too, I'm here, I wanna defend this case. We do not do that lightly. Pre-pandemic, we only did it if you had a basis for winning, a right to be there. Post-pandemic, I'm sorry, during the pandemic, we have been uh, bringing people into the litigation even though their only protections were the emergency uh, uh, protections. Um, because people, because it was better than being homeless, but we are going to go back to being more um, judicious about filing these claim of right to possession and pre-judgment claim of right to possessions. This is what the sheriff puts on your door after they've done your lockout. Um, we do a lot of defense. So if, for instance, if so, this week we had a woman who came in, her notice to vacate was expired. We couldn't get in the next day because she called too late. So we had to wait two days to get in. So the Compton Tenants Union did what we call rapid de response defense. They were at her house for a day and a half while we got into court so that if the sheriff came, there's at least some level of resistance. And often the sheriff will just wait because they know that they're there because we're in court. So rather than hassle with the organizers, they will um, kind of go on to the next and come back a couple of days later. And by then we have our order. If not, the organizers try to negotiate with them. If push comes to shove, the sheriff will do the lockout in spite of the organizing. We've had cases where we were able to send a copy of the order that I just got issued by uh, telephone to an organizer that can then show it to the sheriff while someone is running back to give it to the sheriff. So. Um, so those kinds of sort of exciting moments happen sometimes way too many, they happen way too often, frankly, um, very nerve wracking. Um, but if this is already on the door and you go in without permission, then you could be prosecuted and it's a um, felony misdemeanor wobbler. It could be uh, prosecuted as a felony. Um, I talked about the right to counsel coalition. Just so that you know, there are 11, I think, courts, uh, West Covina, that handle eviction cases. West Covina, Pasadena, Compton, Long Beach, Norwalk, Mosque, Lancaster, Van Nuys, Chatsworth, Santa Monica, and Inglewood. Uh, these um, 
are the initials of the agencies that are covering those courts. You can see that EDN is in West Covina, Pasadena, Mosque, and uh, I actually have a, the, the grant. Oh yeah, here, the grant uh, for Compton is new. EDN also can represent people who are not eligible for the free services in these courts and also theoretically in Santa Monica and Inglewood. In fact, we do not have the bandwidth to help in Santa Monica and Inglewood. We are very much limiting ourselves to West Covina, Pasadena, uh, downtown and Compton. Um, we're also not representing in Norwalk yet. We don't have enough lawyers. Um, I'm gonna skip this. There may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. And let's always remember that when we fight, we win. Um, thank you so much. Let's stop the recording and see if there are questions.